We're live. <laughs> We're live? <laughs> yeah. You bugger. <laughs> it's a bit different, isn't it? To it is. St. Paul Center or whatever. Right, right. We're much more Professional dignified. videos you yeah, do. Yeah. Dignified, yeah. <laughs> Schedule. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Speaking of St. Paul Center. The Emmaus Academy. Emmaus Academy. Yeah. I want yeah, everyone to go check it out. Stpaulcenter.com slash Mac. Click the link in the description. You'll get two weeks free of a bunch of excellent courses taught by Dr. Bergsma, Dr. Hahn, others. <laughs> others, yes. Father Daniel Klimek. I was watching his stuff on the Blessed Mother uh, last night again, just going through his course. Amazing stuff. He's a mystic. You know, he wrote a doctoral dissertation on Marian apparitions with Oxford University Press. So he's like the world's expert on this. Wow. And, uh, but, but, you know, also one of the most moving preachers, you know, that I've ever encountered. He celebrates mass, of course, up at the university and stuff. So he's the whole package. If you could kind of sum up why people should try the two week trial for free. Yes, because it is, it's like Emmaus Academy fills in all these gaps that we all have. You know, I'm a Protestant convert, so there's all kinds of things. I'm like, Our Lady is a sorrows, you know, where did that ever come from? You know, so I was watching that episode last night because I personally don't, you know, it wasn't part of my upbringing, right? So, and uh, Father Daniel Klimek was, you know, explaining how that developed in the Middle Ages and that mm. whole devotion. And so I feel like we, we all have that. We have like this, you know, you know, Catholic inadequacy, like I never got that at, you know, in CCD, or I never got that, you know, at uh, St. Elizabeth Elementary School where I mm-hmm. went. And, and there's all, you know, these courses on Emmaus Road or all these fill in the gaps and like, oh yeah, I can feel comfortable now. Like I really feel like I got a handle on, you know, Marian um, devotion. I really got a handle on the role of the magisterium, you know? Mm. Um, and then, um, you know, got a handle on how to pray as a Catholic, beautiful, beautiful uh, course on personal prayer. And a lot of work goes into it, right? Uh, Because if it were me, I'd be like, well, I just watch YouTube videos on that. What's the difference? Right. Well, this is, this is professionals. Typically people that got PhDs teach this stuff for a living right? and uh, really high production quality and um, laying it down like systematically. And you get a little credential at the end, little little quizzes, you know, so you feel that sense of accomplishment. Nice. Yeah. Stpoolcenter.com slash Matt. You get a two week trial, sign up today. If you don't like it after two weeks, you can cancel it. You won't be charged a cent. You said that you've said this last time. You said someone was a mystic, and you just said it again. And I've been thinking: Is somebody allowed to call themselves a mystic? Or probably only, not. Yeah, you're only allowed to say that about other people who are <laughs> right, like, no, right, right, no, right. yeah, yeah, no. They never claim that for themselves. I'm, I'm, I'm giving my perspective, and I'm right. using the term casually and not as some kind of canonical definition. Good. So, but uh, yeah, we got some awesome people. So it was great having you on the show last time. We only got I think it was an hour and twelve minutes. Right. I think at some point you realize that I wanted you here for like three hours. <laughs> like, oh no, that's not going to happen at all. I got to well, go. Well, not that day. <laughs> but we I were... got all the time in the world today. So whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a joy to speak to you last time. I know a lot of people really enjoyed it. A lot of people get told that the Bible is really unreliable, that the Exodus never occurred, that Jesus didn't exist, or if he did, what's in the New Testament really isn't what he said. And People yeah, got kind of carried stuff. away. They started thinking of him as divine, and that's how Christianity arose. And so it is really important that we address these things. If yeah. people haven't watched the last episode, go check that out. But just sum up where we were last episode. Yeah, so last episode, I think we covered things like the manuscript evidence for the New Testament, pointing out that you know we have, for example, uh, copies of the Gospel of John and most of the letters of St. Paul from, say, A.D. 200, um, only like 150 years after they were written. Um, actually, our earliest copy or fragment of the Gospel of John goes back to 125 AD, maybe you know 35 years after it was written. That's amazing because most of our other copies, uh, manuscripts of ancient compositions like Plato or Socrates only go back to the time of Charlemagne. And we have nothing before, say, AD 700, you know, so wow. we have like a 800, 900 year gap between when these ancient authors wrote and when our manuscripts are. But in the case of the Bible, you know, we're going back to within a century, you know, a century and a half of the composition of these. So, so we talked about that, we talked about that, that uh, manuscript evidence that we have such, you know, thousands of handwritten manuscripts of uh, particularly the New Testament books compared to 
maybe dozens at best of many of the other classical works by, you know, uh, Cicero or, or uh, Julius Caesar or, or what have you. So we, we covered that material. We talked about that. Um, we talked about Jesus' divinity in the Gospels, not just the Gospel of John, but if you read the synoptics like a Jew, you can see that, you know, the calming of the storm, um, his correction of Moses and the Sermon on the Mount, these are all acts of divinity. Um, so we, we covered that. Um, we talked a good bit about uh, the relationship with the Dead Sea Scrolls and how Mark and John have these little episodes, these little vignettes that are illuminated mm. by information from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written in the first century, give us that kind of uh, contemporary color, contemporary cultural color, showing that they're not written generations later um, by Christians who didn't know the you know, first century Judaism. And um, yeah, we talked a little bit about Bart Ehrman and uh, the theory of anonymous gospels. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah. Um, I'm thinking like we probably have earlier manuscript evidence for Star Wars than we do for the Bible. So <laughs> early manuscript evidence isn't enough, right? Like someone could find uh, the text of the Star Wars movies and say, look, this has got to be true because it was written. Well, okay. What our argument isn't that, oh, you know, the gospels have to be true because the manuscripts are so early. Right. We're just trying to put this in context with, you know, what we believe about the rest of the ancient world. Like nobody, nobody doubts that Julius Caesar wrote the Gallic War and, you know, that he's recording events that took place, even though there's like a 750 year gap between he act when he actually wrote that down and when our earliest manuscripts are of it. But um, in, the, in the case of the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, the actual manuscript evidence that we have in the time of composition are a very narrow window. So that doesn't allow a whole lot of time for legendary expansions and interpolations and confusion and all of that. Right. Um, so it's really remarkable within the context of, you know, doing ancient history, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember, yeah. you know, when I was an agnostic throwing these questions at my teachers as if they cared anyway, <laughs> saying things like, why should I believe something that was written 2000 years ago, not realizing that that's precisely the wrong question. I mean, who cares if something was written 2000 years ago? The question is, when was it written in relation to the events? Like good right. evidence does right. become, doesn't become bad evidence because of the right. passage of time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another thing we talked about last time, you know, the, the dating of the New Testament, a recent book by uh, Jonathan Bernier. Um, uh, just a couple of years old now talking, you know, entitled redating the new Testament where he goes through and shows that there's no good reason, uh, to place any of the documents in the new Testament, even after the destruction of Jerusalem, much less after the first century. But, you know, one of the things we didn't get to last time, Matt was talking about Luke and his contribution to the historicity of the faith and the testimony and historical reliability of the gospel tradition. And in the case of Luke, we can tell that, you know, he writes two books, the gospel of Luke and Acts and Acts ends with Paul still alive around AD 62. Uh, so that's only 30 years after the ascension of our Lord. So easily within living memory for somebody who was around at that time. And, uh, and there's no, you know, Acts, uh, St. Paul is still in prison awaiting his trial at the end of Acts. And the most logical conclusion to draw from why the book ends that way is that Luke has brought us up to the contemporary moment when he is finishing up this work. Mm -hmm. You know, p scholars have proposed other explanations for it, but none of them really are as compelling as simply the most common sense interpretation of the facts. This is what's going on. He's brought us up to the contemporary period. So if Luke is finishing Acts in 62 with Peter and Paul still alive, that means he's writing about the history of our Lord in living memory of many of the people who are still alive. Most middle-aged people alive at that time had were, were in their childhood during the events of Jesus. So the significance of that, Matt, is it's much harder to make stuff up. Mm. And this is unique within world history. I mean, yes, we have legends about miracle workers and, and holy men from all different uh, cultures, but those legends and you know stories come from centuries after the lifetime of the actual figure. 
here. That's probably not always the case. Well, there's bound uh, to be some bizarre stories of mystical wonder workers. Do you know one? No. <laughs> yeah. I've never tried to disprove Christianity from this angle. But right. It's bound yeah. to be. Look yeah. it up. Yeah. Look yeah. it up. Sorry, I was paying attention to something oh, no. else. What did you say? <laughs> what did I say? Gosh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See what I have to work with I mean, here? I was saying... I'm also this, trying to run the stream up here. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's got to be wonder workers throughout history that we have early evidence, you know, early manuscript evidence of. It's got to be. That that oh, is, is closer to, to the time of the events than that of Christ. Oh, okay. I'll try to find you. <laughs> not, not, with, not with Buddha. Not yeah, with Siddharth Gautama. I think you're going to have a hard time. What about more modern... Yeah, but, well, I looked into that. Well, I, yeah, I mean, you have the apparitions. I mean, think of the Marian apparitions, the apparitions mm -hmm. at Zaytun, Egypt, and you know, you have contemporary uh, journalistic accounts of the miracle of the sun. Um, you've got, uh, yeah, you know, you've got verification for them. You know, Padre Pio is bleeding from his hands. You know, and you yeah, I'm, I'm of thinking him. of stuff that would contradict Christianity, though, not support yeah, it. Yeah, well, but isn't you know. there a confounding variable with the newer stuff that there's more of a like recording things is more of a like a, a normal thing to do now, whereas recording things written That's down would have point. not been common until. Yeah, it would have been yeah. more expensive, presumably, yeah. to write right. something down if if you had to be very committed to this thing in order to. Right. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit anachronistic to use kind of modern standards of journalism where okay. everybody's got a cell phone and can, you know, uh, videotape people as it were right on their phones and then apply that to the, those standards to the ancient world. I think it's, uh, you know, most appropriate to apply to, you know, use standards that are appropriate to the time I see. when we're talking about, you know, historical events. So if we use the general standards that are used for authenticating you know, historical events in the ancient world, the New Testament comes across very favorably. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to point so out. So how, how expensive or laborious would it have been to write the, the, the book of Acts, say? Yeah, well, quite expensive. That's a, it's a great question, but I mean, you've got to get the parchment, you've got to get the papyrus. This is not cheap. Um, so quite a bit of labor went into that. Right. Wasn't that it was, you know, drastically uncommon it wasn't out mm -hmm. outside the reach of you know a middle class or upper class person but it does it doesn't but, it just go to show that what's your reason for for taking on this endeavor like if, yeah, you're, if i'm the writing the gospel Gax, there's yeah. really got to be a reason it's not yeah. like a, there's probably not many dear diaries from the first century given the expense so if right. you're going to write an account of this wonder worker exorcist from the first century then you really have to have a reason and it might be for power yeah. or influence or fame or whatever. Sure. And I think part of the reason in the case of Luke Acts, aside from, you know, the, the general desire to evangelize the nations, um, Luke is trying to defend St. Paul and he's St. Paul's in an ongoing trial. He's about to be heard before Nero. And so Luke wants to, you know, provide some positive press out there mm -hmm. and uh, get the story straight, you know, for, for the general culture and I think try to create a positive vibe among some of the elite and intelligentsia and, you know, uh, politically powerful people in, uh, in Rome and in Israel, et cetera, in, in terms of, uh, you know, favorability to St. Paul. So I think that's one of the reasons why we have this beautiful composition of Luke Acts. And if Acts is being finished up in 62, then Luke had to been, the gospel had to been written before that because Acts picks up at the end of Luke. And, uh, and it's very clear that Luke is writing history. I mean, this is, this is one of the things, you mm. know, like what, what are the genre of the gospels, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, Jordan Peterson is very, uh, you know, uh, prominent nowadays. I listen to him periodically and he, he doesn't really engage the historicity of the Bible very much. You know, it's always doing this, uh, psychiatric, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, evolutionary psychology there was kind a, of thing. There was a Babylon Bee article that said <laughs> Jordan Peterson considers every interpretation of a passage except for the one the author intended. Right, exactly. Yeah, something like that. And and, and not to slam him too hard because uh, he, he does have some good insights on a number of occasions. But, but you know, just at the beginning of Acts, um, I'm sorry, the beginning of Luke, St. Luke says, look, many have undertaken to 
write a composition of the events that have happened. But now I have followed everything uh, closely for some time, and I'm setting down to write an orderly account for you, O Theophilus. Okay, and that that idea of the orderly account and having followed things for some time past, and then Saint Luke, in fact, mentions uh, from from uh, eyewitnesses. Um, or for those who are witnesses to the events, all of this information in the introduction to Luke's gospel is signaling to the audience that St. Luke is following this the Thucydidean tradition in Greek historiography. And let me just give a little background on that because I know that was like a big phrase there. But uh, with you know, Greek historiography had been going on for over 400 years by the time St. Luke is writing. Uh, the Gospel of Luke. And there are two schools of thought about how you went about it. There was a school of Herodotus, and the idea there was you write down everything that you hear and mm-hmm. you let your readers sort out fact from fiction. <laughs> then there was a school of Thucydides, and Thucydides, and you know, both Herodotus and Thucydides wrote an account of the Persian War against the Greeks back in the 400s. And Thucydides' approach was like, no, 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 you don't do that. You only write what you yourself witnessed or what you get from eyewitnesses. And again, if you analyze the introduction to to Luke's gospel, Luke is signaling to his readers that he's taking the more conservative approach, that this is stuff that he's witnessed or that he's gotten from eyewitnesses. Now, you don't have to believe his claim, but at least uh, acknowledge that he is telling people that I am writing history here. I'm not writing something that happened, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You know, and then you get into the early chapters of Luke, and when you got the Magnificat, the account of the Visitation, uh, the account of the Annunciation, um, it's very clear that Luke is drawing on sources that are speaking either Hebrew or Aramaic, you know, the spoken language of the Jews, because he's translating into Greek, and what he translates into Greek doesn't always make sense. Like that famous phrase, blessed art thou among women. Like, what does that mean? That doesn't really work in Greek. Doesn't really work in English. It's actually a Hebrew idiom. Does it? Does it not make sense? I've never thought of this. It doesn't make sense. If I say "blessed are you among women," it seems to me to say like, "out of all women, you are the most favored" or something. Well, that's that's the Hebrew idiom. But in but in uh, in English, you would say, "You are the most blessed of all women." Okay. But Hebrew and Aramaic don't have a superlative. They don't have an isma. They don't have very. There's no way to say. I see the most of of anything and so the way that you say this and every hebrew student learns this in Mm -hmm. elementary hebrew the way that you say it is if you want to say that bill is the fastest man you say bill is fast among men and that's exactly what that's Mm. exactly the idiom that you got there blessed art thou among women that means you are the most blessed of this category you know Mm. so again it's a hebraism it's a hebrew idiom and it's very clear then that you know, Luke's sources are not speaking Greek, not thinking Greek. He's either getting this orally or written from sources that are in the language of the Jews. And in the case of, uh, you know, Luke 1 and 2, like in 2.19 and in 2.51, it mentions the Blessed Mother either pondering these things or holding these things in her heart, you know, and for a long time and reaffirmed by St. John Paul II, uh, this has been viewed as, you know, Luke essentially tipping his hand as to where his sources are coming from. Mm. But again, the fact that, you know, he's not spe- he's not writing idiomatic Greek there, again, points that, yeah, this is coming from, he's not making this stuff up. This is coming from a source that he's translating into the common language of the time. So, yeah, so, you know, Luke is just a very important, um, you know, historical source for uh, our understanding of the, of, um, of the Gospels, and then of course the the early growth of the church, and then when, once we get into the Book of Acts, he's present for the second half of Acts. Uh, you know, we have all these famous we passages, these four extended mm. narratives in Acts where he's writing in the first person plural. We went here, we went there. Interesting. And you can tell he was present because the narrative gets super high resolution in the we really? passages. So all full of this like extraneous trivial detail that's like, why did he even <laughs> include that? You know, like he throws in, oh yeah, the figurehead of our ship was the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. And like, well, thank you for that, Luke. You know, I'll take that to my prayer. But uh, it is just like he can't avoid. He can't help 
throwing it in because it made a powerful impression on him because he was there. So he kind of, you know, the fact that the level of detail like increases by three or four fold mm. when he's writing in the first person plural as opposed to other passages, it's really, you know, uh, lends, lends authenticity uh, to the fact that he was present for these events. Plus the fact that, um, you know, as they're traveling around, Luke manages to get the names of all these different political figures that they mm. have trials in front of correctly. And this is very hard to do because the Roman Empire was this mishmash of different political organizations that the Romans had taken over. And so the leaders in any given area had different names. So in Thessalonica, the town elders were called polytarchs, which means leaders of a city. In Ephesus, they were called Asiarchs, which means Asian leaders. In the colony of Philippi, which was a colony of retired Roman soldiers, the town elders were called generals because everybody was uh, ex-army, you know, army retirees. And, and as you move around in Acts and they go to these different areas, Luke nails it every time. He gets the right title for the right leader. And he, he's got dozens of historical figures who we know from Josephus and other historical figures. My favorite uh, episode, actually, in, in the book of Acts, um, uh, uh, Matt, is, is actually when uh, St. Paul is taken in front of this figure known as Gallio. And uh, it's right in the middle of Acts. And um, they're in I Achaia, which is central Greece, and it mentions that uh, St. Paul was dragged in front of the local governor who was named Gallio. Well, this guy actually, is na his full name is um, uh, uh, Junio Gallio. Uh, Junius Gallio, and he's kind of like the Jeb Bush of the ancient world. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Why Jeb Bush? Well, Jeb Bush, you know, governor of Florida, you know, relatively successful politician, but overshadowed by whom? His more famous father and his more famous brother, right? Both of whom were presidents of the United States, right? Well, Junius Gallio was a successful politician in his own right. He was a Roman governor, etc. But overshadowed by his dad, who mm -hmm. was Seneca the Elder, and his brother, who was Seneca the Younger, both of whom were famous orators and philosophers and, and all this and really made a splash in Latin literature. So, you know, he's, he's this bit player within this larger um, picture, and he was only governor of central Greece for a single year between about 51 and 52 A.D., and when it says that Paul was taken in front of him, it allows us to date this trial of Paul wow. in the middle of Acts to the very year, mm. because this famous governor, like he, does, he doesn't mean anything to us. We right. read it like Gallio, like who the heck is Gallio? But everybody in the ancient world, well, like, that's Jeb Bush, you know, <laughs> like his brother was this and his father was that, you know, this is like a world famous figure, world famous uh, you know, uh, um, character within uh, Roman culture. And there's Paul giving the defense of the gospel in front of him in that one year that he happened to be governor of central Greece. You know, so again, it's, it's the little things that really impress me, Matt, because mm. it's hard to get the little things right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, you know, I compare it to, um, you know, every state in, in the U.S. has some kind of Bureau of Motor Vehicles. But when you go to the actual titles, you know, some states call it a Department of Motor Vehicles. Some call it yeah. a Division of Motor Vehicles. Some call it a Motor Vehicle Department. Some call it a Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Yeah. So every state has its different terminology. It's really hard to nail that. Yes. And if somebody was trying to make up stuff about getting their license in the U.S. in the 20th, 21st century, you know, they would mangle that. Yeah. But Luke moves all over the uh, the Roman world in the book of Acts, Amazing. going in front of different government officials and nailing their titles and the timing and the dating and these, these famous figures and uh, wow. all while they're still living. You know, yeah. and there's even Marilyn Monroe type figures in the book of All Acts. Right. When you get to the end, okay, there's two famous princesses, mm -hmm. both of whom Paul 
preaches the gospel in front of him and gives a defense of his ministry. One is, one is Princess Drusilla, who was the wife of uh, Felix, the Roman governor. And she was a femme fatale. And when Felix arrives in, um, in Judea, he was just smitten with her because she was drop dead gorgeous. And he persuaded her to divorce her husband and he divorced his wife and got married to her. So it was scandalous, you know, it's, you know, something like the scandals of princess die or whatever. You How know? do we know about her then from oh, extra biblical sources? From Josephus, okay. the, uh, the Jewish historian of the time, as well as from Roman so- soldiers. And, and she appears in some, in, in some, uh, uh, satirical Roman plays and stuff like this, mm. you know? So she was, she's like world renowned, like everybody knew about Princess Drusilla, you know? And, and even more famous was her older sister, Queen Bernice, who also shows up near the end of Acts when there's a trial and uh, King Agrippa shows up with his sister, who's Queen Bernice. And um, she had been married to one king after another and divorced them all and eventually went to live with her brother, who was a king, and she Mm. was drop-dead gorgeous. There's an after story. After the Book of Acts is finished, she went on to become the girlfriend of the Roman emperor Titus, who defeats Jerusalem and then goes back and becomes emperor of the Roman world. So that vaulted her into the spotlight, and now she's, you know, mistress of the Roman emperor. She's like Marilyn Monroe kind of figure. Everybody knew about her. The Roman populace despised her because she wasn't Roman, and they kind of politically forced Titus to put her away. And so he, you know, broke off that relationship and and married a Roman woman to become empress and so on. But what my point, Matt, is these are world famous figures, as famous Mm. in our own day as, say, Mark. Marco Rubio, Joe Manchin, Taylor Swift, okay. whatever kind of celebrities and political figures you want to want to describe. And Luke is describing Paul giving a defense of the gospel in front of these people who are still alive. And Bernice was at the height of her power in 62. She was the most powerful woman in Judea, you know? And so Luke can't make up stuff. You don't have the freedom to make up fiction Mm -hmm. about powerful people who are still alive, you know, and and, 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 and fabricate that, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, some uh, bishop or some preacher, you know, was dragged in front of, you know, Marilyn Monroe and JFK, you know, and had a trial in front of them. You can't make up make that up while they're still alive, you know, and, and pass that off without Mm -hmm. being refuted. So the fact that we have the gospels being written within living memory of those who witnessed the events is a very strong argument in favor of their trustworthiness. You just can't get away with this. I'm just thinking like you reading the Bible must be like, if I took you to my town of Port Piri, where I grew up, I could tell you about every street. I could tell you about all the things that happened here and who owned that shop. It would be, in some ways, a much better experience for me than you, though you'd be seeing it afresh and trying to take it all in. Man, it must be beautiful when you read the Bible. Yeah, well, it didn't always I got, uh, I read that start I, off that I way. no idea who these people are, and like you said, I don't care. I don't mean to not care, I just kind of... Right, myself. absolutely. You know, but if we can, put, you know, again, when we can place ourselves in the contemporary period, we can go back and try to lean into what what must it have been like to say, read the Gospel of John for the first time, or read yeah. Acts when it was hot off the press in like the yeah. year 63, you know? When when when, when all the figures mentioned, Pontius Pilate and, and uh, Felix and Festus, and Agrippa, they're still alive, you know, and, and, and Paul is, is awaiting trial, you know? And uh, so there's, there's so much, there, there's so much backstory to it. And, and again, when, when you can give backstory to little details of a mm-hmm. document that, that give it color and greater impact. I mean, I think th- these are some of the, 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 uh, the, some of the most powerful testimony to the trustworthiness of a document. Scott Hahn said that boredom with the scriptures is not a result of familiarity with the scriptures, like we often say, but due to a lack of familiarity with them. Right. Like the right. more you go into it, the more fascinating it is. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. A lifetime of research. Uh, do you ever do you ever wonder why Christ um, appeared two thousand years ago, and and you know why why not now? Is there any kind right. of good sociological speculation that you've thought about? Right. 
Well, there's different reasons. I mean, there's the chronology of the coming of the Messiah that was revealed to Daniel. Right. But I, I yeah. mean, I mean, from all eternity, God knew he was going to show up right. in 2020. Why right. not? Why not do that? And I know this is an answer we're just speculating <laughs> about, but. Right. Yeah. No, I've always, I've always believed that the reason why Jesus showed up uh, at the time he did was because of the Pax Romana, um, the mm. Roman peace, you know, the Pax Augustus. Uh, you know, when Augustus came to the throne, when our Lord was born, there was a kind of worldwide peace. There was really no mm. major threat, no power that was able to stand against Rome. Uh, Rome was the master of the known world. They were great road builders. They were great letter writers. They were, uh, they had a high literary culture. They admired the Greeks. Uh, they advanced Greek learning, and so you're you're, you're living through a gold, a cultural golden age. It was a golden age of literature, um, a golden age of learning and technology, mm. and and you had the 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 ability to travel and spread the gospel uh, through the known world. Okay, um, look at look at how easily Paul can travel. Paul can travel from, you know, from Syria all the way to Spain. You know, and and he can be safe doing it. You know, he can he can just book a passage on a boat. Uh, he can travel along the Roman roads. This really facilitated the spread of the gospel. If our Lord had appeared in a different age, if he had appeared like the early medieval period when you have the breakdown of communication, mm. really would have hampered the spread of the gospel. But I think that. Uh, social conditions were just right um, for the rapid spread of the gospel throughout the civilized world. Um, you also had the invention of the book, and this was a providential invention. We, we take this for granted. You know, we usually think of a book as this, but technically this is a codex. What is a codex? A codex is a book made not as a scroll, because a scroll is a book, but scrolls are clumsy. Scrolls can get crushed if you put something on top of them. Scrolls can only be written on one side, because if you write on the back of them, smudges, the ink smudges when you roll and unroll them with your hands. Check this out. This can be written on both sides of the paper. This is like double density. Some of our viewers are old, and re old enough to remember double density floppy disks mm -hmm. that had an entire half a meg on them. <laughs> 512K, man. Wow, there's no end to that. But anyway, uh, double density stuff. But you can get twice the amount of information on the same amount of paper because you can write on both sides. It's also random access rather than sequential access. Mm. I remember as a kid having to work with cassette drives to save information where you had to move around, you know, and rewind and fast forward to get... But and then and then floppies came out where you could drop down the head of the floppy on anywhere on the disk as it was spinning around and instantly get your stuff. But look at this, we can instantly go to yeah. Revelation and then I go to Matthew and then back, you know, and try doing that with a scroll. So this was invented around the time <laughs> you <will> fail. <laughs> Sorry, you're gonna get clipped. <laughs> Clipping that. Uh, uh, try doing that <laughs> with, with a scroll. scroll. <laughs> yeah. These thing. are like the little one line of jokes that be uh, over here just intellectual. Right. Yeah, yeah. Tell each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it. But this was. This was <laughs> I saw the seriously. whole edit in my head as he said it. That's why I lost. It. <laughs> Sorry, that's fine. So uh, this is being invented around the time our Lord is born, and then um, Not the book. Not yeah, the, the the codex. This this concept of stacking paper and stitching on one side, then binding it. We take it for granted. I but thought it's that an was invention. like a medieval thing. No, no, it's a vent around the first, around the turn of the millennia. You know, it's, no you know, and, and it, it starts, it starts being popularized around as, as Christianity grows, what? this form is growing in, in popularity. And some scholars theorize that the reason why this triumphed at least so quickly over the scroll was due to Christian missionary work. Because wow. this was so handy for Christian missionaries to take the Bible with them. And in fact, the earliest a uh, fragment of the New Testament we have, Papyrus 52, which we talked about last time, a little snippet of the Gospel of John from like around John 18, that is taken from a uh, codex. We know that it that it's a fragment of a codex because it's written on both sides of the paper and it's got a little margin at the top and it's a little triangular piece. And by looking at the parts of John in the front and the parts of John in the back, 
uh, we can figure out how much text elapsed from the front to the back, and then we can f- we can calculate the size of the page. I see. And it turns out that it was from a copy of John that was about the size of what I'm of my little New Testament that I carry with me. Mm-hmm. So a pocket edition of the Gospel of John. I, I, you've taught me something completely new. I had no idea. Why wouldn't you have the same problem of smudging, like you said on the scroll? You can't write front and back. Because because with a scroll you when you roll it with your hands like oh, this okay. you know okay and and uh, with the page like you never have to place your fingers yes. on the page you can just wow. flip what's the earliest codex we have like Boy, a, like could've... intact codex can you look that up yeah I'm I'd... really putting you to work the earliest codex book that right. would be fascinating yeah well I, I know the earliest codices of the New Testament come from around you know two hundred. Uh, we have a nearly complete Gospel of John from around 200. I don't We've mean got, in fragments, um, though. I mean, what is the book we still have? Well, that, you know, that... Uh, intact book. Yeah. Intact codex. That is a virtually... Yeah. There are probably earlier codices, and I think that the Egyptians played around with codices way back when, but it didn't, oh, cut, wow. it didn't catch on. <laughs> you know? didn't catch on. Bloody but Egyptians. It, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but in the but, first I mean, century, it, really, it, it, to, it must be too old. I mean, I, I've yeah. got a book of the Brothers Karamazov that I've read like five times right now, and the thing's almost falling apart. I either need to buy a new one or have it rebound. Right. And I've, I've had that for like eight years. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, wow. my Bible. I've had it rebound twice. That's your Bible? Yeah, that's my why personal Why didn't you Bible. rebind it with something more interesting than a, than a... Why didn't you get like a nice leather cover? Well, you know, this is a library binding. I had this done by Franciscan University Library, and that's what they chose to do. So huh. this this was this is like uh, it's not leather, but it's like some kind of library grade okay. thing that was done like 15 years ago. You like a hard a hardback cover? I you know, thought... I like a cover that lasts. I recommend to people get a leather covered Bible because that is your longest lasting product. Mm. And everybody wants to go get cheap and get a paperback. Do not buy a paperback yeah. Bible. What that the is, hell is wrong with you? Yeah, that, that's a get major problem. Yeah, yeah. Unless you read the Bible as much as most people read it, in which case it should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I should read it more than that. Um, what did Luke get wrong? Well, it is claimed that Luke gets the date of our Lord's birth wrong because in Luke 2, it says uh, something to the effect of um, Quirinius being governor of Syria during the census that you know was the cause of St. Joseph going down to Bethlehem. So the way that that's usually translated is something like, uh, this was the first census while Quirinius was governor of Syria. However, even there, it's not clear that Luke is wrong because it's possible to, t- to translate the Greek there uh, differently and say, this was, the, mm. this was the census prior to Quirinius being governor of Syria. And if you translate, translate it that way, um, it resolves the uh, okay. historical problem. So, and there's other there's others that say, oh no, our date of Quirinius is wrong, and you know, Dr. Hahn has a theory on that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that is probably the you know that that's a classic you know one example where Luke dropped the ball, and it's not even clear that he dropped the ball there. Um, he he uh, if you translate differently, he's correct there. So he mm. is a really uh, reliable. Uh, histor- historian. All right, then what did one of the gospel writers get wrong? It's going to be something. I don't believe they got anything wrong. Wow. I mean, what, one, of the, one of the biggest things that's claimed is that they get the date of Passion Week wrong. Have we talked about that? No. I haven't talked about that. I don't think so. Well, I this is a book. All right, when is it from? Uh, it is... Codex that we still have. From around... Oh, well, I have to do math now. It says it's 2,600 years old, and it's actually written on gold. Cool. How do you do that? That didn't catch off. Catch How do you off? write on gold? It's like print, like it's like, they like, you know, imprinted. They, like, like braille like? Like punched yeah, it little, wasn't looks, it? I mean, not really, but like they did, they did a little like, uh, like engraving drawings <laughs> on it. Engraving, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's I, called the amazing. Etruscan gold. gold Book. Very cool. Did not 660 know. 660 BC. 660. Yeah, that's that's what Donald Six Trump's sheets official biography of 24 is karat be gold. On. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So it says here that it uh, records the Israelites leaving uh, Israel at the time of Jeremiah and sailing all the way to. Sorry. Oh, so <laughs> 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 Too soon. I'm sorry. I'm I could, people. It was. It was. It was right there. It was excellent. <laughs> 
It was excellent. <laughs> um, I I, I want to. I'm happy to get to what you just brought up there, but I also am interested if you have any if we have any good reason to think that the Exodus happened because often, yeah, I, I've heard a lot of defense of the historicity of the New Testament, the reliability that we can compare and contrast and see that there's very few discrepancies. Yeah. But what do you say when someone says, we've got really good evidence to think the Exodus never occurred. It's just, it's a nice yeah. fairy tale. It's a myth of a, of a people, but it's not yeah. something that happened. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, uh, okay, first of all, you're not going to get direct evidence of that because the Egyptians were masters of propaganda. Uh, so they never record any defeats or anything that goes wrong. <laughs> Okay, so Good it's kind of like, uh, yeah. you know, kind of like our newspapers, okay. you know, <laughs> it's like the New York Times, you yeah. know, uh, it just uh, it's very uh, ideological. Um, so that's that's how um, Egyptian historiography was. So you would not expect that um, a story of a massive defeat of one mm. of the pharaohs, say Ramses II or something like that, where he lost a major part of his workforce, uh, you know, and was defeated by a foreign god, that's never going to be recorded in Egyptian annals. So you can just forget, like, having direct attestation from the Egyptians. Um, now, what you can look for, though, is, is indirect evidence of authenticity. <laughs> and... Um, what, what I find really compelling about uh, the Exodus accounts is, in particular, um, the account of the building of the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness. And uh, what I find so fascinating about that is that uh, when you look at the, how the tabernacle is built, it, uh, it strongly resembles the... Um, uh, the Egyptian war tent of the pharaohs like Ramses II. And these pharaohs were gods, and when they would go on campaign up into Canaan, for example, uh, they would reside in these big courtyards that were uh, ringed around by curtains, and they would have like a tent in the middle, and this tent would have an outer court and an inner court, and the pharaoh would sit enthroned on the inner court on a throne with two cherubim on either side. Wow. Now, we have pictures of this. We have you know, uh, you know, ancient engravings of what these war tents look like. And the dimensions, the layout, it all resembles very, uh, very similar to the layout of the tabernacle in, um, in the books of uh, Exodus and, and thereafter. And what's so interesting about that, Matt, is that it's been popular ever since, you know, the middle of the 1800s to suggest that the Pentateuch was actually written in the time of Ezra, mm. you know, like a thousand years after the events that it records, and it's all fictitious. Well, if it's being written in the time of Ezra, how is it that it matches up so well with uh, Egyptian cultural realia of that time of, um, you know, the, the new, what we call the new kingdom period, which is often suggested as we're talking about like the 13th century BC, the 1200s BC, the time, you know, around Ramses the second and before, and a little bit after within that time period, this is often suggested as the time of the Exodus. And in fact, the, like the technology and, uh, the, the cultural forms that are described in the Exodus resemble that time period in Egypt. In fact, in King Tut's tomb, we have something that looks like the Ark of the Covenant. We have this big gold box on poles, only on top, it's got a figure of the god Anubis, this, uh, you know, like jackal-like god, or it's like dog god. And, um, but, but anybody biblically literate looks at it like, wow, that looks like the Ark of the Covenant with a pagan god on top. And so what is going on? What, what I would argue, Matt, is that when Moses leads the people out of Egypt, he uses, you know, some cultural forms and um, some cultural technology, you know, even like the shape of different vessels and chairs and tents and so on like that, that they're familiar with because they built these things for Pharaoh. But Moses tells a radically <clears throat> different uh, theological message with this material. So the Egyptians had this kind of sacred tent of Pharaoh, their, their God King, when they went out on war. Well, the Israelites go out into the desert uh, and they organize themselves as an army too, as we see in say Numbers ten. They're on the they're doing make war, waging the battle the the battles of the Lord, and uh, but they have a tent. And in the sacred uh, throne room of the tabernacle, you have the two cherubim that are signs of divinity, and and of royalty, but no idol, hmm. no image. This is the unseen God. This is the God that cannot be represented by animals or human form or whatever. And so we're using, you know, and, and this makes sense to me, Matt, because, you know, 
you would you would want to use language and cultural forms that these mm-hmm. Egyptian slaves could understand. So you want to use something that communicates, just like we want to. You know, we you know we use the form of the podcast, whatever you know, to communicate mm-hmm. to our contemporaries, right? So you want to use cultural forms that communicate, but you want to say something radically different uh, than than what was said with them previously. And I think that's what we see in in the Exodus. So that kind of indirect evidence, again, that to me is is very strong. That yeah, this is being composed. This is this mm-hmm. is reflecting the historical reality of the time period. That it's uh, that it's describing. So indirect evidence feels more compelling because it's it's accidental evidence. It seems, as it were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Um, it, you know, the, the the big stuff can be faked. If, it, if there was just some names dropped mm. in the book of Exodus, well, you know, you could say, well, some fiction writer looked up in a history book and found some names of some pharaohs to drop. But but when it's embedded into, as it were, the culture of the Pentateuch, that's even stronger. And then you, then, then too, we have from the, from the Egyptian second temple, uh, sorry, excuse me, from the Egyptian new kingdom period, we also have a whole bunch of uh, treaty documents, covenant documents uh, between say the Pharaoh and the king of, uh, of Hatti land or the Hittite empire, which we would know as Asia Minor. So these were major empires that kind of intersected in, in what's now Israel. They kind of had a border there. And so they, they made uh, treaties back and forth with one another. And the fascinating thing about these treaty covenants that, we, that, we've, that we've discovered, and we have several of them, they're, they're written in Egyptian and they're, there's a copy in Hittite, you know, and, and uh, in, in, in also in the international language at that time, which was Akkadian, and you don't want to go on to all that and get down on a rabbit trail, but different languages these these covenants are preserved in, and the structure of them looks like the book of Deuteronomy, hmm. with an introduction and then kind of a historical prologue about the past history of the covenant parties, and then we get into some major like constitutional principles, and then we get into a whole bunch of very specific laws, and then we end with instructions about how to store the treaty document and how often it should be read publicly, and a, a list of blessings for following the covenant and curses for breaking the covenant. Boom, 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 boom. This has been known for, uh, boy, since the 1950s at least, um, this material you know, has come out. It's like, dang, the book of Deuteronomy is following this covenant treaty formula, uh, uh, format that we can attest to the time period that many have proposed as the time period of the Exodus. And what do we know about Moses? Well, he was raised in the Egyptian royal court where they were sending these documents. This is like, mm. you know, political, you know, international politics with in, international political treaties that were passing back and forth. And Moses, if he was raised in the court of Pharaoh, would have been trained to read these languages and read these political documents and be familiar with them and how to engage in, you know, international diplomacy. So, you know, Moses would be a natural person to be able to write such a document, not between two great foreign kings, but between the king of creation, God himself, and his covenant people. Okay, that's fascinating. What about Noah's Ark? <laughs> Noah's Ark, yes. Well, atheists often yeah. claim there, there's no reason to think there was a worldwide flood, therefore this is clearly just a... Right, yeah, yeah. Well, you get into all kinds of things there. Um, you know, there's there's two schools of... Uh, you know, First of all, I don't think it's an option for us as Christians to just dismiss the flood and say, oh, this is a myth. Okay, If you look in the catechism... The, Catechism of the Catholic Church treats Noah and his covenant as real, okay? And talks about the covenant of Noah remaining in force, okay? So, um, uh, you know, I don't think it's an option to just dismiss it. Now, if, if we're going to take Noah seriously and the flood seriously, there's basically two options. There's a local flood option right. and there's a global flood option, right? So if you're going to go with a local flood, one of the best candidates is the inundation of the uh, Black Sea Basin. Uh, which is thought to have happened around 5000 BC, where that narrow strip of land that's now near Istanbul collapsed and that whole area was mm. radically flooded. Now, some have put that forward, and it's, a, it's in about the right place of the world uh, to fit with the account of Noah, so possibly that. And so in that case, you have a massive, albeit regional, flood 
that's described in kind of hyperbolic language in the Bible. And, you know, you can kind of work with that. Okay. No, I'm personally not totally satisfied with that. Mm. If you want to go with a global flood, then you basically have Why to... Why aren't you satisfied with the local flood option? Well, because you don't need an ark then. You could just migrate to high ground and stuff like that. So it doesn't uh-huh. make, you know, the, the ark really you know, kind of demands a global flood. So, (laughs) you know, so if you're going to go with a global flood, then you need to reinterpret the geological column. And, um, and there's reasons to believe that a lot of the geological column was laid down very quickly. Geological column is everything that's under our feet right here in Ohio. It's like two miles of sedimentary rock all laid down by seawater. Do you ever think about that? No. And it covers the whole continent. You know, so you go to the Grand Canyon, it's all exposed there because, you know, a, 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 a post ice age lake collapsed and tore out the Grand Canyon. And so we can see all the, the layers down like a layer cake. But all this sedimentary rock that was, de, that was uh, you know, deposited when, uh, when oceans covered the entire continent of North America. Oh, dang, that's a lot of mud. That's a lot of debris being laid down. Not only that, but in many of these layers, you have entire layers where all these fish or shellfish or nautiloids is one one that particularly comes to mind. There's a whole layer of frozen nautiloids, which are these these long, very pointy uh, squid-like creatures, kind of long uh, shell like that, kind of like a co- like a long cone, and uh, they're very speedy creatures, and they're all frozen. You know, like tick, you know. And the mud lit got laid down and they're frozen in time. So this is something that happened very fast. We're not talking about like, Mm. you know, sediment filtering down and like burying them on the bottom of the ocean. A lot of the, a lot of the fossils that we have in the, in the geological column are just uh, frozen time, you know, frozen instant. We have fossils of one fish in the act of eating another fish or of, of a fish giving birth, you know, and then frozen there and, and so on. So there's a lot of, a lot of evidence of catastrophic, virtually instantaneous fossilization in uh, the geological column and, and young earth creationists, you know, those who, you know, really take the global flood seriously point to this kind of uh, data as, you know, evidence that points to a, you know, global catastrophic flood. So, so these young earth folks, would they say that um, Noah brought kangaroos on the ark or that kangaroos <laughs> were created after or they evolved from different creatures? Yeah, What's... yeah, probably. No, they would, they would, I would assume they would say that they were on the ark. Yeah. And that just, it just sounds bullshit to me <laughs> when you say that. I'm just, it just sounds right. completely implausible. Why would Why? people go with, how big does this ark have to be? How many animals is that? Well, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of the variation that we see in species uh, can be explained by genetic decay, gene- genetic entropy. Okay. Um, so, for example, all the great cats can interbreed. So, depending on how you define a species, you might say they're all one species. And, um, you know, so it, it could be that, uh, you know, all the major cats derived mm. by genetic entropy from, uh, you know, originally very large, something like a, a saber tooth tiger, you know, kind of animal, you know. So I don't know, you know, this is, I, yeah. I'm getting all to uh, this is this is out of my you're getting me out of my lane, you know, <laughs> I'm just speculating, you yeah. know, folks can, you know, that that's not really my wheelhouse. That's so okay. Folks can go look, that's okay. Look at, uh, but, but these are yeah. questions that atheists yeah. throw at us. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely. nice to know that there's a couple yeah. of options that the Christian right. might take. Yeah. What about things like Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah. That is one of the most sensational uh, stories <laughs> Sum in, it up for those in recent who, uh, history. Yeah. Not as aware as they should be. Yes. Okay. I mean, so Sodom and Gomorrah, it, it looks like one of those mythological <laughs> stories out of the Bible, right? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, fire comes from heaven. Yeah. Tell me another one. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, Matt, when I was growing up and, you know, reading Genesis 19 and stuff like that, it, it was a challenge to my faith. I'm like, okay, come on, really? You know, this really happened? Or are we supposed to understand this? Something else. But, um, you know, so uh, several years ago now, maybe like 15 years ago, I was at the Society of Biblical Literature, which was being held at, in that year in San Francisco. 
And um, I was in one of these, you know, conference rooms and I just wandered into this session because it had an intriguing title, you know, something about archaeological discoveries at Tel El Hammam <laughs> in Jordan. I thought, well, I'll walk into this, you know, because uh, a lot of these conferences at, at, you know, the Society of Biblical Literature, like these ideologically driven, you know, uh, post-colonial feminist, whatever, you know, interpretation of this, that or the other thing. So I like to go to ones that are actually about language or history or something. Somebody actually dug something up and we're talking about data, you know, so. So this archaeological session, I wander in, I start listing. And as I'm listening to this presentation for about 45 minutes, near the end of it, I began to realize, oh my gosh, these people presenting think that they have found the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. (laughs) That's what they're saying in a really roundabout, really understated way. So at the end of the presentation, they, they stop the presentation and they open up for questions and they, do they describe these two city mounds that they had found on the Jordanian side of the Jordan river and, uh, in this destruction layer and so on. And so I raised my hand immediately and I said, well, did you find any arrowheads? The reason I asked that, Matt, is when you have a destruction layer of an ancient city, if you find arrowheads in the destruction layer, it means that an army caused the destruction and they were shooting arrows at the defenders and blah, 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 blah. Mm. If you find a destruction layer and there aren't arrowheads, that means an army did not destroy the city. And then probably it was some kind of natural event, Mm. right? So I'm curious, like what destroyed these two cities that you guys think are Sodom and Gomorrah? And uh, so the, the researcher starts to get very bashful when I ask this question. He says, well, I didn't really want to go there. But all I want to say uh, while we're recording this session is that it was a heat event. (laughs) And there's like 20 other people in the room and we're like looking at each other like a heat event. Like, is that like a wardrobe malfunction? Like, what what is is a heat event? You know, like, okay. And then and then he stopped the recording and like the official session was over, you know, and so it was like off camera at this point. So all of us in the room like mobbed the guy at the front, like, okay, you know, tell us what's going on. And, um, and so this reach researcher, uh, Stephen Collins from, uh, from, a, he's from a Southwestern, uh, university in the U S here. Um, he says, okay, uh, so we get down to this, uh, this destruction layer of this city that we're beginning to think is Sodom. And I, uh, we, we, we pulled up a, um, a piece of pottery. And, uh, when I looked on one side of it, I thought, oh no, our, our research is ruined because I saw that it was glazed and glazing wasn't invented until the Ottoman period, or at least the kind of glazing that he thought he saw. And the Ottoman period is like 1000 AD. And if you're pulling that up, that means you've got contamination in your archeological dig. You got like later artifacts down there, but then he turned the, the pottery over and on the back of it, it was typical bronze age pottery, but it was glazed on one side and uh, and not on the other like what on earth is going on so make a long story short he sends this away to a lab in the u.s and uh, for testing and they come back and say well that glazing is trinitite okay great what's trinitite well trinitite is that uh that that glass layer that you get when you basically set off an atomic bomb in the desert and it melts the glass and Mm. you get a kind of crystalline formation that's called trinitite. So this pottery was raised to over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit for a brief moment of time. Like, oh my gosh, this is what's going on. So they, they continue to bring up this glazed pottery. And eventually what they discover is, among other things, they, they also begin to find human remains. They find human skeletons that are complete up until about halfway up the mm. backbone. And then there's just a scorch mark and there's nothing on the top of the body. And they find the skeleton behind a wall that's about, you know, four feet high. You know, so what's going on here? Well, long story short, they find massive evidence that a huge heat blast from the sky at about 25 degrees above the horizon incinerated these twin cities on the Jordanian side of the river, (laughs) just north of the Dead Sea. Yeah. And and they have the the artifacts uh, to prove it. And again, the reason it has to be from the sky? 
What's that? The reason it had to be from above? Is because of the angle. Like they have these these human remains that apparently were standing upright behind a wall and I everything see. above the wall was incinerated and they do like the angular calculations and they can see, oh, that blast was coming like this, you know? So they can calculate the angle at which. And 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 the, the stuff when they when they find the stuff in situ and they've got a scorched side or a melted side, you know, again they can triangulate where this was coming from. And so long story short, you know, uh, the, from a, from a natural material, you know, explanation, this looks like a meteor blast, you know, that's what I was about to ask. What was the naturalistic explanation? Yeah. You know, uh, like, uh, like in Tunguska, I think it was called (laughs) Siberia back in the 1800s. There was this, you know, massive meteor blast that flattens, you know, several hundred square miles of of taiga of, you know, n- Northern Russian forest and so on. And you know, when a me- meteor comes into the atmosphere, you know, it, it heats up and then explodes and it, you know, it can be like a, like an atomic blast. But uh, again, the timing and the location and the cities all track with what is described of Abraham and Lot in Genesis mm. 19 and the surrounding chapters. And then the Bible talks a lot about Sodom and Gomorrah for centuries thereafter, you know, all the way into the prophets uh, like Isaiah and Jeremiah continue to mention Sodom and Gomorrah. This stuck in the cultural memory because this was a major world historical traumatic event for us, like the two towers going down, you know, like this major disaster where these two cities were entirely wiped out by a heat blast from the sky, you know, by the hand of God as it were. But no historical source records this, even though Sodom and Gomorrah were um, arguably the two most powerful cities in the in that entire region. They were they were at a trade route, you know, from going from east to the west, from Egypt out to, you know, the far east, and everything was was passing through there. So very powerful, very wealthy cities. And uh, only the biblical record, you know, has a historical account of this um, you know, meteorological, geological event that we can now attest that tracks with the time period and the description. And also that blast going out, going up go, creates a great vacuum, which then recollapses and, and pulls all kinds of salt sediment from the Dead Sea and then th- slams it on, on that location that was in the bullseye of, and, and that's where you get, you know, the, the discussion of, you know, became a pillar of salt and all the, f- the hellfire, the brimstone, you know, the, mm-hmm. um, that, that was all, torn up by the blast and, and redeposited over the cities. So it's absolutely fa- fascinating. And folks can look this up. I'm not making this up. Steve Collins, a very reputable uh, archaeologist from um, something like Southwestern Methodist University or something like this. Uh, you can look on online. Just go to Amazon and type in like uh, the discovery of Sodom and Gomorrah in his book. I forget the exact title. Thursday's on it. But uh, yeah, it. yeah, you can find it and put a link to it. Wow. And uh, so, so yeah, that that really changed my perspective on the Old Testament, Matt, because wow. what it pointed out to me is things that sounded too outlandish. Mm-hmm to be history that I just, that even I as a believer was tested, attempted to discount suddenly and sensationally shown to be, you know, actually that's a historical event. (laughs) (laughs) Now, do you think it was a meteor? Do you think that a Christian can say it was a media oh, and it's God using the media to? Absolutely. I see. You know, I, I think this, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the providence <laughs> is in the timing. I mean, that's in the, that's the timing of God. It's like, it's like yeah. if you're a sinner and you walk into a church and get struck by lightning. Something right, like that. right. Oh, that was just a natural, <laughs> you know, naturalist explanation. No, these things are in the hands of God, you know? Wow. So I, I don't, I don't see any conflict there. Now you're, you're so good to answer all these questions because I'm peppering you with things I didn't tell you we were going to talk about before this. I'm, <laughs> I'm shocked at how much you know. You'd be shocked at how little I know, I think. Um, <laughs> the Red Sea, was it the Red Sea or is that a, yeah. a typo? Yeah, yeah. No, um, the, the Hebrew says Yam Suf, which means Sea of Reeds. So I think that the body of water that's being talked about is one of the many large reedy lakes uh, that are on the border of Egypt that, that, uh, that um, cause a major barrier to travel when you're trying to get what is that? East okay. and out of Egypt. Okay. And uh, it gets translated in the Septuagint as the Red Sea. Why is that? Um, 
Uh, probably because they were uncertain of the meaning of the Hebrew and they were trying to connect it up with a body of water that they mm. knew was geographically in that area. Okay. So I suspect there was. So God yeah. didn't necessarily. God didn't split the Red Sea then. Uh, not as we know it. Okay. I would. I. I. You know, there. There are those who theorize that he did. You know, and that that argue and that have a root for the Exodus and and said. And I have no problem with my God splitting no. a major body of water. That's not a problem for me. But it's just that you know the Hebrew says Yam Suf. You know, uh, which is Sea of Reeds. And I think that the intention is. Um, you know, we don't know exactly what the what the layout was because at, at the border of Egypt, you kind of got a rift valley there, and you got many of these 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 lakes there. Um, and uh, but but one of them uh, was this uh, you know Sea of Reeds, and uh, it's still a miracle because you know you could say well it wasn't as much water, but well it was plenty enough water to drown the whole Egyptian army. <laughs> okay. Now, so uh, if this that, if this event actually occurred, shouldn't we expect to find chariots and armor from Egyptian sh- soldiers in some of these? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would would expect so. But yeah, we haven't. But it, no, we haven't yet. But it's not just very easy to go through and do a systematic you know, <laughs> Let's go excavation the water again. Right. Yeah. I mean, if it's at the bottom of the Red Sea, I mean, these are politically charged places. They're not easy to go in there. You got to get, you know, you got to get permission from different governments. Everybody's got to have an, has a, has an interest in this. So it's just not easy to conduct. But surely people have tried. Uh, they have, yeah. you know, and they, people have had, have tried and people have seen things that look like. Uh, chariots at the bottom of the sea and, uh, you know, fleeting glimpses of artifacts that they were not able to mm. recover. Um, so there's, there's tantalizing reports, um, but, uh, but nothing, you know, verified at this point. So then if the Exodus account is accurate, what about the splitting of the Sea of Reeds? Do we have any other reasons, if any incidental reasons or any th- such thing like that to think that it actually happened? Well, the the Exodus route is very plausible, and uh, you know, for on, on a question like this, I would really recommend the works of James K. Hoffmeyer, who was is a professional Egyptologist and taught for a number of years at uh, Trinity International University and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School up in the Chicago area. And uh, he's got two books in particular, uh, one called Israel in Egypt and the other called Israel in Sinai. And one's about the historicity of, um, you know, the, the Israelite sojourn in Egypt. Um, and he points to, you know, a, a lot of evidence for large groups of Semitic slaves in Egypt during the second, uh, I'm sorry, during the New Kingdom period, et cetera, their housing and where they would have lived and so on. Uh, unfortunately, the area where the Egypt, where the Israelites lived was in, you know, muddy Delta land that just basically kind of absorbs anything that gets built on it. Hmm. So it's, it's really hard to excavate. It's not as, not as nice as upper Egypt is very dry desert conditions and things will preserve for thousands of years. So it's hard to get, uh, you know, precise, uh, archeological remains from the areas where the Israelites live. We have some though, that points to, um, you know, uh, Semitic slaves, Semitic would be the the uh, people group that the Israelites are part of. And, um, you know, the, the Exodus route is plausible and some of the specific geographical markers uh, that are mentioned, cur- you know, can be connected. You can kind of connect the dots and the ancient geographical locations of these um, Egyptian uh, fortresses and border cities and so on as you mark the way out. So who's ever writing the account of the Exodus has a familiarity with mm. Egyptian geography in the second, in why do I keep saying second temple, I'm thinking New Testament stuff in the new kingdom period. Mm. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of circumstantial evidence for the plausibility and the historical context of the narrative. So really, yeah, I'd really recommend that Hoffmeyer Israel mm. in Egypt and also Israel and Sinai, which, you know, goes into the book of Numbers and you can kind of trace the itinerary that's mentioned in Numbers and Deuteronomy from uh, known locations as they're wandering around in the wilderness. And, um, and, and some of the, you know, the, um, the, uh, uh, the cultural phenomena that's mentioned too is, is stuff that's attested out in Sinai, you know, like rocks cracking open and, and releasing water. Um, this is, you know, part of the, 
the the nature of the terrain you get these these aquifers and sometimes that you know the you got a lot of breccia which is like these these shattered rocks and the kind of the geological formations of the area mm-hmm. and so you can kind of get the sudden emergence of a spring and that's described a couple of times in uh, the numbers narrative. So, yeah, there's kind of that that circumstantial evidence. Yep. We would like more, you know. We'd like to, uh, you know, dig up uh, an Israelite sandal or something like this. Mm-hmm. And uh, thus far, you know, that's not been forthcoming. But hey, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls took us till 1947 yeah. to uncover. So, so if you weren't to accept something, yeah, yeah. Gee, that's fascinating, eh? Mm-hmm. Um, can you think of something? that you learned through your studies about the Old Testament, in addition to what you've already said, that really increased your faith in the reliability of the Old Testament. So oh, you've, yeah. You talked without, about Sodom and yeah, Gomorrah. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Like uh, when I was going through seminary in the late 90s, that was a really bad period in terms of biblical <clears throat> archaeology where, where a school called minimalism was really uh, in, in control, uh, where, where people were um, you know, just freely claiming that uh, David and Solomon were these myths um, of, you know, some ancient fiction writer, I could never bring myself to believe that the accounts of David in first and second Samuel were, were mythical. And the reason why Matt is because those narratives are told at such a high level of, of cultural resolution. And so much attention is paid in first and second Samuel to minor characters, um, Uh, like Abner or Joab, these generals that worked for Saul and for David, who really play no no theological role thereafter or or really aren't important outside of the lifetime of, say, David and maybe a little ways into Solomon. And so the question with the books of Samuel is why mention, you know, David's wife, Abigail, and her husband, Nabal? And, you know, why talk about Saul at all? Like Saul has like no theological significance after David comes to the throne. And and why talk about so so embarrassing? a lot of like embarrassing episodes in David's life, like uh, the Bathsheba incident. And, you know, when he acted like a crazy man to get out of the the court of one of the Philistine Kings, you know, it's like not very Mm -hmm. flattering, you know? So there's a lot of unflattering stuff about David and a lot of just kind of, you know, cultural and biographical um, stuff in first and second Samuel that doesn't go anywhere, but it's great storytelling. And so just reading it, you have a sense that whoever is writing this is writing within the lifetime of these figures, or at least their descendants. And these characters are still fresh. They're still important to the public that's going to read these books, et cetera. And so, you know, even in the nineties when I was in seminary and, and people were claiming, you know, David and Solomon are fictitious. I was like, you know, you, you, the books of Samuel do not read like a later fiction writer. Um, this is material that's, that's very contemporary at the time of writing. But then in the late nineties, uh, uh, thanks be to God, they found a stele, a, 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 a monument inscription, S T E L E uh, pronounced different ways. Some people say Stella, some people say stele anyway. Um, but this inscribed, uh, this monumental inscription, um, up in Dan, which is far northern Israel. It's called the Tel Dan inscription. And it's it's an inscription from an Aramean or a Syrian king, Hazael, and he's bragging about how he conquered a bunch of uh, Israelite and Judean kings. And, uh, and he refers to the kingdom of Judah as the house of David. And so it was the first mm. time when David's name was recognized on an archaeologically recovered uh, inscription. And it just sent shockwaves through the entire biblical world, you know, the house of David. And, and of course, the, the minimalists were backpedaling and trying to reinterpret and say that, well, it doesn't really say that, but they didn't win the day. And most people are like, no, it's, it says house of David, guys. You know, that's, mm. that's what's free. And, and that was how the kingdom of Judah was being referred because these these ancient kingdoms were typically called the house of and then the founder of the dynasty that was ruling them. Mm-hmm. So that's that's very significant. The house of David about a century to a century and a half after, um, you know, the time of David. And then a, a few years later, they found a, a major tax collections uh, center. 
uh, called Tel Zayat, uh, which was uh, west of Jerusalem, where the government co- collected wine and oil and other agricultural products from the farmers as taxes to the royal government. And this tax collection center dates to the time of David. So that means we've got like a administrative royal structure going on here and we're collecting taxes and that suggests something of a considerable like state, you know, bureaucracy and stuff going on in the time time period of David. And then they went back and um, re-looked at a famous inscription called the Moabite Stone or sometimes called the Masha Stone, uh, which is written about the middle of the 800s by a certain King Masha of Moab who's mentioned in uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, at, at uh, he, he writes about how he has uh, thrown off the yoke of uh, King Omri of, um, of Israel. And, uh, and uh, actually, he claims to have destroyed Israel. A little bit hyperbolic there. <laughs> claims that nobody's left. But uh, anyway, so like mm-hmm. I said, fake news and uh, propaganda was very common in the ancient world, as it is in modern ju- journalism. And there, too, on that Masha Stella, they found David's name as well. Also, the kingdom of Judah being referred to as the house of David. So now two instances of David's name on extra biblical, archaeological, uh, archaeologically recovered uh, instances. And, you know, that really, that that was pretty significant. Um, That, you know, that kind of reset uh, the discussion uh, in terms of the the central historical narrative of the Old Testament. It's wonderful. Hey, Thursday, can we take a break? And then we'll come back and ask a ton more questions that I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to ask. This clip was sponsored by Hallow, and I have to say it's very easy to promote these guys because their app is probably the best app I've ever used. Not just Catholic-wise, but just all apps ever. If you want to grow in your prayer life, if you want to learn how to meditate, if you want to listen to excellent Catholic audiobooks, you can't go past Hallow. Go to hallow.com slash Matt, sign up over there, and you will get access to the entire app for, uh, for free for three whole months. So what are you got to lose? Here's the answer nothing. All right, I want to say thank you to Emmaus Academy. They've put out this brand new digital platform to help you grow in your love of sacred scripture and therefore your love of Christ. If you're like me, you know how tempting it is just to waste so much of your day on YouTube, like maybe you're doing now, or listening to political podcasts and other things. The truth is we do often have the time to grow in our knowledge and love of scripture. We just need a helping hand. And that's what this brand new digital learning platform is going to help you do. It has short courses on scripture that you can take. You can learn from Dr. Scott Hahn, uh, Dr. John Bergsma, Father Boniface Hicks, many more. I've been on this platform. I have a subscription to it. And um, I mean it when I say it's actually really excellent and it'll help you love scripture. I think a lot of us want to love scripture, but we find... We fight, I don't know, we, we feel guilty that we don't love it as much as we should. Platforms like this will help you do that. So click the link in the description, stpaulcenter.com slash Matt and sign up. When you sign up, you get two weeks free to the entire platform. I mean, think about how many times you and I have sub- subscribed to say Hulu or something else. Um, when we could be doing something like this and growing in our love of scripture. So again, stpaulstander.com slash Matt, go sign up today, you get two weeks for free. If you don't think it's worth it after that time, cancel it, you won't be charged a cent, but I think you'll be really impressed with what you see. Talents 
just came by these things naturally. They had to work at them very hard, at them very hard, at them very hard. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. Go and sign up. We, you know, we played the ad, right? Did you play the ad? Yeah. I thought you just played like the intro. The No, 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 no. I played the ad. I cut an the, ad. Don't dog. worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We've got a ton of questions filing in only from our local supporters. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. You get the point. Still Hello, go sign up though. Ben Still Stapp, go sign whatever. up. Hello.com slash Matt Frad, whatever. Get three months of free. Still you know. do sign up, but. Yeah, sign up, but just, I'm not going to. Um, hey, Dr. B. Do you like him for people you, Dr. B? It's fine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a no, he does not at all. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's what I usually go by, actually. Dr. B, when are you and Dr. Petrie going to publish <laughs> volume two of a cat? <laughs> <laughs> One of it's your favorite fine. questions. <laughs> most most <laughs> frequently asked question Let me ever. finish it just so people know what we're doing about. A Catholic <laughs> Introduction to the Bible, Volume 2 of it. Your first volume on the Old Testament was awesome. Much love from a past disciple of the Word. Ha, cool. Yes, so Dr. Petrie is hard at work at that. The The word he gave to me was Oh, this that, is the first one here. Yeah, this is the first one. Oh, no. See that on the camera. Hold see it up that on by camera. your face and I'll see it. Oh, by yeah. my face. Beautiful. It's by my face. Yeah, yeah. Yep, thank you. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so the New Testament, which was always planned, this was always planned to be a two-volume work, uh, that is in the hands of Dr. Petrie. He is probably 85% at least done with that. He sent me the first 50% of it two years ago um, and then got busy with the Augustine Institute. But the word is that the Augustine Institute's giving him a couple semesters off to finish this baby. And uh, so he's doing that. So I, I drafted this, and then he looked it over and added some stuff. Now the shoe's on the other foot, so he's drafting the New Testament mm. volume. I'll look it over when he's done, add a little, you know, my tweaks, and uh, and then we'll get that through the, pro- pro- bleh, the process with Ignatius Press. So Have you ever considered writing a book on the incidental proofs or verifications of... That has been done. Oh. Yeah, no, there's stuff are. like there's stuff like that out there. Linda yeah. McGrew did something like that. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's what is it called? Um, I forget. Uh, the unintentional convergences or something like that. Mm. Um, I just I just read that actually. Did you? Yeah, I just read that like uh, Could you three look weeks that up? ago. Linda McGrew. Just see her books and you'll you'll figure out which one it is. But yeah, yeah, she's an interesting character. Her yeah. husband's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, he's. Uh, how do you spell McGrew? I think M C G R E W. Um, Drew says using Doctor Bergsman's book Bible Basics for Catholics to lead a Bible study with a group of my friends. Cool, cool. Alyssa says, what are the comparisons of how many transcripts we have of the Gospels versus other historical texts, and where can we go to find this information? Yeah. Um, one really good classic source is F.F. F. Bruce, goes by his two first initials, F period, F period, Bruce. Uh, the New Testament documents, are they reliable? Um, this is written back in the 50s, I believe, the first edition. He updated it through his life. Um, now they just keep reprinting it, but you can get a cheap copy. Probably You can get a used copy for $3 off uh, Amazon, I would imagine. And Bruce goes through and he, he lines up the statistics on the mm. manuscripts. So uh, working just on my working memory, there's something like 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament uh, ranging from, you know, the, the, the 200s AD all the way into the, you know, later medieval period, um, as opposed to, say, something like um, uh, Julius Caesar's um, 
uh, Gallic War. There's like maybe 10 manuscripts of that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and you know, things like Plato's Republic, you know, you're talking about maybe a dozen manuscripts and so on. So, but uh, Bruce lays out all those comparisons. And so it's, it's usually, you know, uh, uh, you know, tens of copies or less than tens, like in single digits for a lot of classical documents versus like 5,000. Wow. Yeah. Did you find that book by chance? Yeah, I got it. Oh, hidden in plain view, undesigned coincidences in the there gospel and acts. That's right. That's right. Undesigned it's in the description. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a great book. Uh, C.S. Medor says, Hi, Dr. John. I'm sure you've been asked this till your ears bleed, but I haven't heard your answer yet, so I'll ask. What is your impression of Jordan Peterson's psychological <laughs> reading of Genesis? I've yeah. listened to them and find some parts compelling and some parts where he just misses the mark. But what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, it's funny he should ask because I'm, I'm reading through uh, his, what is it, 12 Principles to Live By, which I did not read. 12 Rules for Life or 12 Rules for Life. Life. Yeah, no. It's the first the, one? It, it's the first one, yeah. yeah. And I, I was not aware how much of that book is biblical interpretation, actually. It's his psychological interpretation. First thing I would say about it is he's working in a, a very... Um, uh, revered tradition of philosophical reinterpretation of the Bible. And this is a hoary tradition that goes back all the way to Philo uh, Judeus, Philo of Alexandria, the, the Jewish philosopher who was a contemporary of St. Paul. And he does a philosophical reinterpretation of the scriptures of Israel, you know, using the tools of Greek philosophy. And I see Jordan Peterson standing in that kind of tradition He's, uh, he's like, he's got one foot in philosophy and one foot in, in the psychotherapeutic tradition, especially Carl Jung and, and, uh, figures like that. And, uh, so I think there's, th there's a tradition of doing this kind of thing with the scriptures. And I think that's, there's some, there's, you know, th there's some validity to it. As I listen to Jordan Peterson, half the time, uh, I, he, uh, seems to me to be doing a lot of kind of um, evolutionary psychological superstition, I would call it. It's just kind of like pseudoscience. Um, and I strongly object to his, uh, you know, ideas of, of, uh, of our human evolution. I think, I think a lot of the points he's making could be just based on biology. You don't have to make up a just so story about we were hunter gatherers or, you know, or the bear at the mouth of the cave. You can just talk about our biology. Um, but uh, but the, the other half of the time, I'm powerfully moved by insights that he sees. And a lot of the things that he sees, like in the creation narrative, uh, you know, the, the nakedness as vulnerability. I've been saying that for years. Well, you'll, you, you find that in the interpretive tradition, you know. Um, there is a lot of, you know, fundamentally archetypical stuff going on in, in the stories of Genesis. Um, the stories are true. Uh, I believe they're speaking of, about historical figures, uh, but they also speak to the human condition and are generally applicable to dimensions of our life. So, um, you know, on the whole, I think it's positive. I am very grateful to Jordan Peterson for bringing the Bible back into mainstream discussion of culture. And I think that's very valuable and, um, and and uh, so as, as I would say net positive. Mm -hmm. Father Boltz says, it's great to hear about the increasing evidence for the reliability of Scripture. However, are there arguments and evidence for such things being passed around Christian circles that you think actually aren't very good and Christians should stop citing them? No, I'm not. I'm not too aware of that. And the, and the reason for that is I, I'm not off. I'm not usually out into the kind of like uh, popular mm -hmm. uh, Christian uh, social media and stuff like that. I'm not not aware. Um, periodically, students will come to me and say, "Well, I heard somebody say this. You know, that the Greek really says that, or the Hebrew really says this." And um, and sometimes it's just like, you know. I got a doctorate in this stuff. I've never heard that, mm. you know, and I, I just don't, don't know where that's coming from. So I do run across kind of like, um, you know, pseudo information. Are there know. arguments you used to use to support the reliability of the scriptures that you've since back, you've since decided aren't as good as you once thought? 
Not that I can remember offhand. What about this? Someone has told me that the plagues that God sent in Egypt represented a different Egyptian God. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That is true. Um, With many, well, okay, maybe not every one of the plagues, you know, that's debatable. But on many of the plagues, you can can clearly recognize that there's a particular Egyptian God that's in the bullseye of that. Like target. was the Nile something? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the Nile god was that was Hopi, was the Nile god, and that was one of the major gods of Egypt. And so the the turning of the Nile to blood. I mean, in terms of Egyptian culture, wow. the, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's being said culturally by that. You know, it's like I slew your god and he bled out. That's the message of the of the Nile being turned to blood at the end of the plague sequence. When you get those three days of darkness, that also is clearly aimed at Amon Re, uh, the uh, the Egyptian sun god, um, the head of the Egyptian panthe- pantheon. And every night he would descend in the west and and do uh, do battle with uh, the Egyptian chaos demon Apep, also known as Apophis in the Greek tradition. And then every morning he would rise victorious, you know, over the forces of darkness and you'd have, you know, daylight again. Uh, Well, him not showing up for three days uh, probably made all the Egyptian priests sweat themselves because like the sun god's not coming back, you Mm -hmm. know? And so it was a, a ritual slaying of the sun god. So yeah, and then and then the the um, the plague on the uh, the 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 frogs, you know, the the Egyptian goddess of fertility was known as Hechet, and she was portrayed as a woman with a frog's head. So very attractive. Yeah, exactly. Like great body, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, and and you know, she's the goddess of fertility, and she gets out of hand, and you got frogs everywhere: frogs in the kitchen, frogs in the fridge, frogs in the bedroom, frogs in the streets. You know, it's comical. It's it's wow. ludicrous. It's ma- making a making a laughing stock out of out of the Egyptian goddess of fertility. So I don't know that you can um, like gnats. Uh, yeah, gnats, you know, that that's a little bit harder. You know, some have linked him up with uh, uh, um, uh, Hefer, the uh, the Egyptian god of resurrection, who was portrayed as a beetle. It's more of a stretch. Uh, so maybe, you know, but 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 I would say this, even, even the plagues where the specific matter of the plague may, might not directly point to a specific Egyptian god, you still have the the general fact that the Egyptian gods were responsible for the welfare of Egypt and they were doing a poor job of it uh, in the face of the God of Israel. And that's actually reflected. If you look in Exodus 12, 12, it says, uh, I will, uh, at the end of the plague narrative, I will, I will uh, place judgments on all the gods of Egypt. So the, the biblical text itself Mm. suggests that there's a theomachy or a divine combat going on here and that God's not just judging the Egyptians, but he's judging the Egyptian gods. And uh, so, yeah, no, there's, there's validity, uh, validity to that interpretation. And with several of the plagues, it's as clear as day Mm -hmm. that we are doing, you know, a, a kind of attack on Egyptian theology. Wow. That is fascinating. That really changes the way you read that. Yeah. Uh, C. Blair says, new supporter, long-time lurker. Thank you so much for being a local supporter. Can you discuss the Q document and the relationship with the Gospels? In college, I got a minor in Christian religious studies and found this theory interesting, if not a little troubling. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about that. And, uh, you know, this is more the the wheelhouse of Brant Petrie and Michael Barber, who are New Testament scholars and specifically have, you know, written major works on the gospels and stuff like that. So I defer to them and often consult with them on these, these uh, topics. But, um, you know, the, the Q document, what is the Q document? Well, the Q document is a hypothetical document that is, that was uh, hypothesized by scholars to explain why there are passages between Matthew and Luke where Matthew and Luke are very similar, but it's not in Mark. And so the dominant hypothesis uh, within kind of like mainstream secular New Testament scholarship right now about the composition of the, of the Gospels is that Mark writes very early on and some other unknown person writes a document called Q that has a lot of the teachings of Jesus included in it. And then Matthew comes along and uses Mark and Q and his own materials. And then Luke comes along and uses Mark and Q and his own materials, but Matthew and Luke don't 
don't use each other. Now, this theory is under serious attack by many other scholars. Mark Goodacre uh, is a well-known um, gospels expert who's written a, a, a famous book called The Case Against Q. And he says, no, it's simpler to just take uh, Luke as using Matthew and then get rid of the hypothetical document. So um, I don't think that Q really needs to pose a danger to the faith. Um, F.F. Bruce, who I mentioned before, as you know, people should look up his, his classic book, uh, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? Um, F.F. Bruce looked at this paradigm and he suggested actually that Q was an early form of the Gospel of Matthew, or it might be the collection of sayings that Matthew is said to have written according to early fathers like Papias. So in, in Bruce's understanding, you've got Mark writing early and Matthew producing an early document of Jesus' teachings. And then Matthew or Matthew's co-workers coming back later and taking Mark's narrative, which had the authority of Peter behind it and combining it with Matthew's already, you know, existing teachings document and then adding some more unique Matthean material in it. And that's our canonical gospel of Matthew. Now, unfortunately, this theory is usually not presented in such a benign way. When you go to most major universities, they say Mark and Q, and then they draw an invisible lasso around Mark and Q and posit the unwarranted uh, proposition that anything that's not Mark and Q is made up. So you can kind of trust Mark and you can kind of trust Q, but anything that's in Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark and Q is fiction made up by Matthew and Luke. But that's not a necessary proposition. There's no reason that the material that's unique to Matthew or unique, unique to Luke could be just as early, just as authentic, could come from an eyewitness, et cetera, but just wasn't written down by Mark or this other, this other document. So mm -hmm. that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's great. Mitchell Godfrey says, do the skeptical critiques uh, or critics who use late, later dates regarding the Gospels, do they have a response to recent arguments that the Gospels were written earlier? Are they still trying to maintain that they were written much later? Yeah, um, you know, you can look at the response that's that's come to um, Jonathan Bernier's book on redating uh, the New Testament. And uh, actually, there's not a lot of response. Um uh, it's it's rare in New Testament scholarship for scholars to come to come outright and present the data uh, for why there is you know the claim that uh, say Matthew and Luke have to be written in the 80s and so on. Um, my uh, my colleague Brant Petrie uh, when when we were together uh, in graduate school he decided to track that down and found that if you, you track the whole datings down, it gets back to scholars in, you know, roughly speaking, 19th century Germany, who are saying that, oh, the descriptions of the destruction of Jerusalem and the eschatological discourses are like the, Jesus' last sermons in Matthew and Luke, where he describes Jerusalem being destroyed, those have to be written after the fact. That's what it comes down to. And so for those who don't believe that Jesus need, you know, well, I should I reverse that. For those of us who believe that Jesus could know the future, mm. the usual reason for dating Luke and Matthew into the 80s doesn't hold. I see. But, but that's really what it comes down to. And so Brant wanted to write about this, but his uh, doctoral uh, advisor to, <laughs> emailed him back in all caps and said, do not question the date of the Gospels. So uh, that that was off the table. Like you don't want to you don't want to touch these sacred cows when you're a young scholar. You want to mm. wait till you have tenure. Mm. Uh, that's basically it. So interesting. Uh, T. Ann says, "How do I respond to my daughter who is in a same-sex relationship when she says the passages in the Bible that refer to homosexuality don't apply today, and to those in loving relationships?" I, I get a kind of first response. Um, and go then, ahead. Yeah, you well, go. it would be just to ask, okay, if I could show you that you're mistaken and that these verses do in fact condemn homosexual acts, would you change your lifestyle and mind? Because I often think what we're doing when we're engaged in sinful activity is looking for a justification for that thing. Yeah. And really, if we were to be honest, it really wouldn't change. 
Right. So that would be the first thing. Like, are you, are you even interested in looking at these verses to show that they do, in fact, condemn homosexuality or not? And then if you are, then we can have a serious discussion about it. But I think a lot of the times the answer is like, mm, not really. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Matt. And uh, yeah, there's there's been, um, you know, a lot written on that. Um, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes, I could come up with uh, with some books that have been written to refute that. Uh, over here at uh, Pittsburgh uh, Theological Seminary, a uh, famous scholar now, you know, drawing a blank uh, on his name, but written an entire book on uh, the Bible and homosexuality, addressing all those claims like, mm -hmm. oh, well, you haven't translated the Greek word properly mm -hmm. or whatever. Suffice it to say, I just got done writing um, a biblical theology of matrimony going from Genesis to Revelation and all through the Bible. It's one man, one woman uh, for life. Even, the, you know, people say, well, what about polygamy? Polygamy is always shown to be a problem in the Old Testament. It always leads to uh, trauma, um, familial discord, and uh, even, you know, uh, rabbis and, uh, you know, biblical theologians and so on for a long time have recognized this. It's what I call the implicit critique of polygamy in scripture. I mean, take it, the, the first man to take more than one wife is Lamech, this guy who's uh, seven times more evil than Cain. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about him in, uh, in his 12, 12 rules, you know, Lamech, you know, who claims to be 77 times, you know, worse than, you know, his ancestor and stuff like that. He's the first one to take more than one. You know, what is the sacred author trying to communicate by telling us that bigamy was invented by this sociopath who brags about his murders to his multiple wives, you know? And then when you, when you look at the flood narrative, um, uh, it's actually the sons of God taking multiple wives or becoming polygamous that provokes God to send the flood and all the humans and all the animals that get on the ark are monogamous. Remember two by two, whereas those that get drowned in the flood are polygamous. Um, and the ancient Essenes who we've talked about before the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on, they noticed that. And that was a major argument for lifelong mm. monogamy that they took uh, from the scriptures. So anyway, um, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, it's man and woman. And uh, marriage is not just like a, a tangential thing to biblical revelation. Like the marriage of Adam and Eve is the high point of the creation narrative. If you study it, the, you know, chapters one and two of Genesis, the marriage of, um, of the uh, bride and the lamb in the book of Revelation is the, really the, the culminating point of the whole Bible, okay, and also the book of Revelation. So these, you know, and right in the middle of the Bible, you have the celebration of marriage in the Song of Songs, which is understood uh, in the Israelite tradition as Messianic, as referring to, you know, David and uh, his bride, which is Israel, which is to come. You know, so all through the Bible, marriage is this central reality that symbolizes God's covenant relationship with his people. And there's a kind of a metaphysical re resonance between the covenant between God and his people and the covenant between a man and a woman, like two crystal glasses. Like if you rub on mm -hmm. one and the other vibrates, that's what human marriage is to the covenant between God and his people. And so when we monkey around with uh, human marriage and try to do man and man or woman and woman or one man and two women or whatever you have, every time we vary from what we have revealed in scripture, it leads to great difficulty. Yeah. I found just... the book on homosexuality, by the way. Yeah. yeah what's that? Uh, Robert Gagnon. That's it. Robert Bible Gagnon. and homosexual practices, texts and hermeneutics. Yeah. That's what I would recommend folks look at for these arguments that, oh, it doesn't mean uh, homosexuality means something else, you know. I would also recommend people check out some of the stuff Trent Horn has written. He did a debate slash dialogue with a quote unquote pastor who identifies as gay, Brandon Robertson. So if you look up Trent Horn, Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-A-N, Robertson, you might find that debate interesting because they go over a lot of the arguments. Yeah. And then um, Father John A. Weiss, uh, I think it's I think his middle initial is as A, but uh, Weiss W. A. I. S. S. Uh, has written uh, from a, like a pastoral perspective, a really, really good book. It's something like um, uh, Love and Our Brokenness or something like that, mm -hmm. but w which deals with you know um, 
same sex attraction mm. and and uh, you know born uh, to love there gay you go. lesbian identity relationships wow this is a long title sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah put a link to that father yeah. weiss a very good book and, and very pastoral and, and sympathetic because he's you know, um, just done pastoral care with a lot of people with, you That's know, great. attracted to people of the, other, of the same sex. And, we have an interview coming yeah. out soon with a fella who uh, was actually a seminarian hiring gay prostitutes, encountered Christ in seminary, imagine that, and wow. began to find a great deal of healing in his own life. And wow. years later, he's now married to a woman, still has same-sex attraction as well as also. Right. Um, so it's, and it's a beautiful story and it's a, it's very merciful and you might find it's going to come out shortly. You might find that helpful. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Josh Mumby says, Dr. Elaine Pagels, yeah. religion historian, makes the claim that the gospel of John was written in response to the gospel of Thomas. What does Dr. Bergsma think? I don't see any evidence for that. And the irony with Elaine Pagels is that she's a feminist but she's a defender of these Gnostic gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas and others that are written uh, centuries later that don't have the early manuscript attestation that we've been talking about. You know, John, you know, complete gospel of John, you know, essentially a, a, a nearly complete codex of the Gospel of John. We're missing some of the first leaves of it that got worn off, you know, from the year 200. Um, the manuscript evidence for things like the Gospel of Thomas, we're talking like the 300s, you know, and later. But, but this is the thing, Matt, you know, Elaine Pagels is a feminist, but she's a champion of these Gnostic gospels, but these Gnostic gospels are really so anti-woman. And some of them say things like, uh, oh, you know, say to like Mary Magdalene and like, well, we'll portray Jesus as telling one of the women in the gospel narratives that she's got to become a man in order to become saved. Transgenderism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, the first life. proof, biblical first proof. proof of transgenderism. Yeah. Sorry. But it was, it was really, sorry. it's like, you know, women are more earthy or more bodily. And so they, they've, they've got to be more transformed. And, right. And so I think like, you know, Deformed Dr. Pagels, kind of why? Thing. If you want to exalt the status of women, why, you know, champion yeah. the Gnostic Gospels? Anyway. Interesting. Um, Mitchell Godfrey says, the Proto-Evangelium of James does provide a lot of information important to Catholic tradition. How many of the fake Gospels are attempted pious? Well, that's a great question. First of all, can we just talk about the Proto-Evangelium of James for those who aren't aware? Right. And what we learn about the Blessed Mother through that and how reliable that might be? Yeah, so the Proto-Evangelium of James, you know, people are going to give different dates, but, you know, maybe the 200s, okay, so maybe 3rd century. Um, some might put it into the 2nd century, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's a... Uh, a, an infancy gospel talking a lot about, um, you know, the, the, the circumstances of our Lord's birth. Uh, but most significantly, um, it, it uh, attests to an early Christian belief in the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother. And so it actually recounts like a midwife going in and testing the Blessed Mother out and finding that she's still virgo intacta you know and and this stuff so it's, it's quite you know blunt uh about that um not historical or like I, I wouldn't put historical credence to it but what is interesting what th what i think it is helpful is to show that the um the belief mm. in the perpetual virginity of the blessed mother was so early and so firm that there were overzealous Christians in these very early centuries uh, already producing works to kind of, you know, go a little too far in trying to defend it. But And so even if you don't accept the historicity of it, or at least the reliability of it, yeah. it, it does show, correct me if I'm wrong, an early belief that yeah. there were virgins consecrated to yeah. God, yes? Yes, yeah, it's it, it attests to a very early, very firmly held belief in the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother before, during, and after. Uh, so this is not like some kind of medieval uh, devotion that gets mm -hmm. exaggerated. It's it's there from the very early generations of Christianity. The proto So he, he asks, and it's a great question. I haven't thought of this before. So this document we're talking about um, provides some information important to Catholics. So how many of the fake gospels are attempted pious writings... And how many are nefarious Gnostic or other writings trying to twist the faithful away from apostolic teaching? Yeah. Yeah. Most of them are uh, the latter. Most of them are heretical. 
most of them are Gnostic. And you can tell that because of the emphasis. Yeah, on... because of the direction where they're going, they they um, they have a tendency to deny the real humanity of Jesus. Um, some of these uh, fake or uh, you know pseudepigraphical gospels go into docetism, which is the idea that Jesus only appeared to be really human. Um, so typically, it's pretty easy to 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 pick up where the uh, you know kind of the um, the theological ideology is going in these documents, and and the reason why they were composed, you know several generations later into the Christian movement, so to speak, is to provide uh, um, some kind of uh, textual basis, some kind of scriptural basis um, for uh, these, uh, you know, non-Orthodox beliefs, essentially. Have you looked into whether or not Muhammad, I think it is quite clear that he did, used apocryphal gospels in his writings? And if you have, do you think that's a good argument? (laughs) <laughs> uh, many good arguments. Another good argument right. against Mohammedism. Yeah. No, I haven't looked into that specifically. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Kyle Whittington says, how do you respond to the accusation that Abraham should not have been praised for his willingness to sacrifice Isaac in light of all the prohibitions of human sacrifice throughout the rest of the Old Testament? Hmm. Yeah. No, I would say that um, Abraham is in in dialogue with God, and he's acting in trust. And the Book of Hebrews explains that that uh, Abraham figured that uh, God could raise the dead, and so the whole Abraham's whole willingness to go through with that was a kind of implicit faith in the in the resurrection already. And the whole key to understanding that narrative in Genesis twenty two is to understand that it's radically pointing forward to a different only begotten son who's going to carry the wood of his sacrifice up that very same mountain because that is the temple mount where they're at and uh, there that other only begotten son is going to be laid on the wood and actually going to be sacrificed Mm -hmm. and so i think it's it's really impossible to deal with genesis 22 uh, apart from looking at uh the anti-type looking at the the telos looking at the goal towards which it's pointing and the real message there is is a, is a it's a singular test, and God doesn't do this kind of testing really to any other figure in salvation history, and certainly not to most of us. But um, God is is asking Abraham and Isaac, Isaac who's a young man at this time, Isaac who's stronger than his father Abraham, Isaac who carries the carries the heavier load up the mountain. Remember, he's got the load of logs for the sacrifice. His geriatric father's only carrying the uh, the knife in the in the fire pot, you know. No way that Abraham could have over, overpowered Isaac at the top. This had to be an Isaac, a, a, a sacrifice that Isaac willingly mm. or freely accepted, um, and that's what all the most ancient Jewish commentaries, really? the Targums, they all they all that's make a fast. point that Isaac's grown, that he accepts this willingly, and that's implied by the narrative itself. But. Um, so this is a willing sacrifice on the part of father and son, a cooperative act. But really what God is saying is, Abraham and Isaac, are you willing to go through with the kind of sacrifice that I, the Holy Trinity, am going to have to experience in order to bring blessing to all the nations? And Abraham and Isaac say, we are willing. And then by their actions, they, they prove it. And so at the last minute, God calls that off because he only wanted to see the consent. And since they've shown that they consent to this kind of self-sacrificial love that the Holy Trinity is going to have to undergo, they merit becoming the instruments through which God's going to bless the nations. And that's the message at the end there, Genesis twenty-two fifteen through 18. Because you have done this and have not withheld from me your son, your only begotten son, it says in the RSV CE uh, second edition, uh, I will surely bless you. And then it goes and enumerates a bunch of blessings. And then the climactic one is, and through your seed or in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And that's looking forward to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from symbolized by the blood and water from the side of Christ when he gives his life on the wood at that very location, you know, uh, 1700 years or so later. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. We have a lot of local supporters who are Protestant and they're discerning the Catholic faith and it's wonderful to see them there. 
This person, Bronze Fury, says, What are the differences between the Protestant and Catholic Bibles, and why do they differ? Great question. Okay. There are seven books in Catholic Bibles that are not found in Protestant Bibles. Um, we did not... The, the, the typical Protestant claim that I believed for the first 28 years of my life was that Catholics added these seven additional, from our perspective, from Protestant perspective, additional uh, books into the canon of the Old Testament at the Council of Trent in order to bolster their papist non-biblical opinions, right? Well, first of all, there's all, you know, out of these seven books that are commonly called the deuterocanonical books, um, and we're talking like first and second Maccabees, Sirach, the book of wisdom, Judith, Tobit, uh, and Baruch. Okay. So, uh, out of these seven books, the only one that touches on a Protestant Catholic controversy is second Maccabees, which records prayers for the dead and the practice of praying for the dead implies such a place as purgatory. Okay. So, that and, and all the rest are kind of neutral. The the content of Tobit, Judith, etc., you know, on, on terms of Catholic Protestant issues, this really makes no difference. So it's only Second Maccabees. Okay. Now, what happened was uh, Martin Luther in his debates, um, and he wasn't even, you know, Martin Luther wasn't envisioning the whole thing that happened with the Reformation, you know, but he was just he was just spouting off and complaining. And he got into debates and he took issue with purgatory and the whole doctrine of purgatory. And his opponents in public debate said, well, you know, look, Second Maccabees implies that there's got to be some, some kind of place like purgatory. And in the heat of debate, mm. Luther kind of made a radical move. Like he pulled the rip cord and like parachuted out by, by claiming that Second Maccabees wasn't canonical. And on what basis would Martin Luther claim that the, that Second Maccabees wasn't canonical? Well, it wasn't accepted by the Jews. Okay, that was one argument. And the other thing was Saint um, Jerome, who was heavily influenced by the Jewish tradition because he went to Be to Bethlehem and learned Hebrew. Saint Jerome speaks against uh, some of the deuterocanonical books in his. Uh, uh, prefaces to the Vulgate translation. So based on St. Jerome's complaints and the Jewish tradition, Martin Luther dispenses with the deuterocanonical books in order to get rid of Second Maccabees. That's in a nutshell. I know professional historians are just like cringing right now and saying, oh, you know, I understand. You want to go into much higher resolution of how that all worked out, but I'm trying to keep this brief. All right. So what I discovered uh, when I, in, in my first semester in graduate school, we had to read St. Augustine, and we had to read his famous work called On Christian Doctrine, which is a little manual on biblical interpretation, which I still use in my classes for my grad students. And in, um, I believe it's book three of On Christian Doctrine, St. Saint Augustine talks about the canon of scripture, and he talks about how you determine which which books are inspired and which aren't. And then he gives a list of the inspired books and he includes all mm. of the deuterocanonicals. And I almost uh, lost it mm. uh, when I was reading this because I was still Protestant. It was the fall of 1999. And I was shocked. I couldn't believe that Augustine was listing Tobit and the books of Maccabees as biblical. And the reason, Matt, is because Lutherans and Calvinists who are kind of the classic Protestants, okay? I was a Calvinist. Lutherans and, and Calvinists revere St. Augustine. Lutherans regard him as the proto-Luther. Calvinists regard Augustine as the proto-Calvin. And so I read a lot of Augustine, but never a passage where he lists these <gasps> Catholic books, you know, because I was taught they weren't added until Trent in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. I later went on to find out not only does St. Augustine list them as canonical, but the Council of Rome under mm -hmm. Pope Damasus I in 382, AD 382, listed them as part of the canon, reaffirmed by some local councils in Hippo mm -hmm. and Carthage in North Africa in like 397 and into the 400s. 
And then it wasn't much of an issue through much of the medieval ages, but um, uh, you can find them all listed in Thomas Aquinas in like his first inaugural lecture uh, at the University of Paris. He gave a famous lecture called Hic Est Liber, or This is the Book. And he lists all the books of the Bible, including the Deuterocanonicals. St. Bonaventure lists them. And we're talking three centuries before the Protestant Reformation. And then perhaps most significantly, the Ecumenical Council of Florence in the 1400s, okay, uh, list. And this is a council uh, in like uh, the 1440s, like 1441, okay, it was one of the dates given for the Council of Florence, a little messy. Um, messy council, but uh, this is a council where the Greek bishops and the Greek emperor were invited to come over to Italy. And so you had representation of the West and the East, and it was truly ecumenical. They hashed out the differences between East and West, and they came up with a common canon. And that's still the canon that we use as Catholics. And it's the same one from Rome 382 that's been reordered with, with the Deuterocanonicals. And this is in 1441. How many years is that? That's 60, 70, 77 years between, before 1517 when Luther nails the theses. Okay, so you've got an ecumenical council more than 70 years before Luther that's listing all the deuterocanonicals. So the reason I emphasize this, uh, Matt, so much is that Protestants are consistently going to claim that we Catholics added these books at Trent, and that's just not historically true. They were used, quoted, and listed by the church fathers, like Augustine being a primary example, mm. affirmed by church councils in antiquity, and then affirmed by an ecumenical council uh, three quarters of a century before the Pre Reformation actually broke out. So that's not what is at stake there. Well, as a Calvinist, when you learned that Augustine listed the Bibles we have in the Catholic Bible, other than shock, how did you process that? Um, I processed it by, by saying to myself, oh my gosh, I've only been exposed to a limited uh, selection of Augustine's works. Um, we only read the confessions and only certain parts of the confessions and then, and, you know, certain parts of the city of God. And I'm like, I have not you know, the full truth has been hidden from me. The, the full truth has not been revealed to me. I, people have not been completely honest with me about the history of the canyon. Canon, that's how I processed that. How, and, how long then before that moment and you looking into the Catholic Church? Did uh, that... Only a matter of months. Oh, really? So a few months later, um, I, I was in dialogue with a Catholic friend, Michael Dauphiné, now at, the, uh, at Ave Maria University, and we had reached an impasse in kind of biblical apologetics. Uh, I gained a lot of respect for his Catholic apologetics. In fact, today's first reading for the Feast of the Assumption, um, that was my first indication that Mary might be something more than just, you know, the mother of Jesus, but might actually be queen of heaven. There was this incident where Michael and I were sitting in uh, the food court at, called the huddle uh, in the University of Notre Dame. And um, he had just defeated several of my apologetic points about Catholicism. And I was trying to think of something to really like pin him to the wall. And so I challenged him because I saw this icon of the Blessed Mother on the wall in the, in the food court that said, Mary, Queen of Heaven. I'm like, all right, here's one for you. Give me one passage of scripture that gives any indication that Mary is Queen of Heaven. That's an almost blasphemous title. And he didn't even miss a beat. He went straight to Revelation 12 and he just laid it out. And he says, look, we've got a woman here. She's in the sky, which is the heavens. So she's heavenly. She's got a crown. So she's a queen. So she's a heavenly queen. And then she gives birth to a male child who's destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron, which is clearly Jesus, because that's an allusion to Psalm 2 mm -hmm. about the Messianic son of David. And so you've got a heavenly queen who gives birth to Jesus. How can this not be talking in some sense, at least I see. about the blessed mother. And I was like, <laughs> you know, where did you come up with that passage? You know, are you sure that's in the book of revelation? Let me check, you my, know, Bible. Let me, let me check my Bible. And that, that just floored me. 
Uh, a but, common response to that from Protestants, though, is it represents Israel or the church with the 12 apostles, or the 12 disciples. Yeah, you, you know, sure. But uh, every other character there is an individual like Satan's there. He's the red dragon and he's an individual. The The male child is clearly Jesus and he's an individual. So if you're going to accept that the male child isn't just, you know, isn't just a corporate identity, but it's specifically Jesus and the dragon isn't just a corporate identity, it's specifically Satan. Like, how can you rule out I that see, the yeah. woman can't be also be an individual? You know, uh, yeah, fair the, enough. Because the, there's also an eagle that takes her into the desert. The eagle doesn't represent anyone individually, right? Yeah, and it doesn't work to take her just, you know, just corporately. You know, um, no. My argument's against yours. So you have the right. eagle that takes the woman. I'm saying to you that that wasn't an individual person. Revelation was pointing to. Oh, oh so okay. why not? You know, so. So maybe your argument isn't as good as you think it is. If you say every individual in this mentioned in Revelation is in reference to a specific individual, since I don't think right. the eagle is. Right. Well, okay. Let me go back, you know, back to this though. The woman gives birth to the male child. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's not you, Mary. <laughs> it's like, like, okay, but why do you have to say that? Like, why, why are you so why, bent on this not being Mary when it couldn't seem clear? Right. I, I yeah. mean, that's my, but okay. My, my th this is the thing. Like the, the way that Michael put it to me is like, can you rule out? I like that. It's the, right? I like that low bar. Yeah. yeah. Can you rule out? And I'm like, no, I can't rule that out. Um, and, and, you know, all through the, all through the scriptures, Mary is more than Mary. I mean, uh, she's symbolic of the people of God, just like Jesus in many episodes is more than Jesus. He's kind of like when Jesus goes into the desert, you know, he's mm. kind of the embodiment of Israel, you know, uh, 40 days in the desert for Israel, 40 years in the, in the wilderness. And so, you know, John, when he leans his head on the on the chest of Jesus, that's kind of an archetypical act for every disciple. And yet John is also a historical individual, you know? Mm. So I don't think, so the question of like, is Mary symbolic of the people of God or is she an individual? It's like not an either or uh, kind of thing. Anyway. This is um, great, yeah. But uh, where were we going with this? Uh, we're we were still talking about the canon. You would, uh, you, I asked you how long you became, until you became a Catholic oh, after encountering okay. what Augustine Yeah, did. yeah. And so, so, so Michael challenged me to read the Apostolic Fathers. And so I read Clement of Rome, who's clearly not a Calvinist, and that whole document's about apostolic succession, which is clearly a very Catholic thing. And so I was frustrated with Clement of Rome. I began reading Ignatius of Antioch, thinking that he would prove to be a Calvinist and make my point that the early church was Calvinist. That didn't work. And I start reading through Ignatius of Antioch, his seven letters, and I really recommend that people do this. But when I got to his letter to the Smyrnaeans, where he says, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, and then I'm going to quote. Uh, did I quote this before on the show? Sure. I can't remember. But anyway, St. Ignatius of Antioch says, stay away from anyone who refuses to confess the Eucharist mm -hmm. to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father is raised for our salvation and that bullseye kind of hammer force testimony to the real presence and that anybody who doesn't hold that it's the flesh that suffered and the flesh that was raised is the same as the eucharist anybody who doesn't hold that isn't even an orthodox christian and don't even hang around with them i was so convicted and i realized that my belief was not the faith of the early church. And if I went back to the first century, I wouldn't even be recognized as a, as a real Christian. And that was so convicting. And I decided I, I needed to become Catholic, if only for the real presence. Um, and, then, and then Augustine, speaking of Augustine, he's got these amazing testimonies to the real presence. In his Psalms commentary, he says that Jesus held his body in his own hands at the Last Supper. Okay, deal with that, Calvinists. All right. Um, in another place, he says, it's not a sin to worship the Eucharist. It's a sin not to worship the Eucharist. And that was particularly mm. powerful for me as a Dutch Calvinist, because we had a doctoral statement that said that the, the Catholic mass was a condemnable idolatry because in it, bread and wine were worshiped as if they were God. So we were, were outright dogmatically committed to denying the real presence and condemning the mass as an idolatry. And here's 
Augustine saying, no, it's a sin not to worship Jesus's Eucharistic body. Do you remember where he says that? Uh, we can find it. Sure, sure, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've caught it in, in yeah, a, I, I've sorry. quoted it and I've, I've cited, I, I should have it right to my, No, no. it's, it's in my book, Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic. Okay, that's good to know. I hadn't heard of that book, Stunned by yeah, Scripture. Yeah, Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic, OSV. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Now, yeah. one thing I've heard um, James White bring up in debates against Catholics in regard to Sola Scriptura is... You know, Christ would often say to the Jews, have you not read? He seemed to be holding them uh, to these books that were God-breathed, and yeah. there was no pope or church to infallibly declare which was infallible and which wasn't, and yet Christ still held, you know, expected them to know. So what what, what with that? And, and here's, the, here's the question that someone says. On what basis did the Jews before Christ trust in the Old Testament if the church's authority, as we know it, hadn't been established yet? What distinguished inspired from not inspired books? Well, they were in a state of confusion. I mean, certain books were held by all branches of Judaism, and those were the, f- the five books of Moses. So mm-hmm. those were indisputed. And you'll see that Jesus will often have recourse to them. And specifically, like when Jesus is challenged by the Sadducees who only accepted the five books of Moses on the question of resurrection uh, during Passion Week, you'll notice that Jesus doesn't attempt to persuade the Sadducees based on the testimony of the prophets. Like when you're talking about the resurrection, the easy place to go would be like Ezekiel um, uh, 37 and the vision of the dry bones or something like that, or, or one of the chapters of Daniel that speaks about the resurrection of the dead. But he can't do that because they don't accept that as canonical. And so he, he goes to the passage of the bush and uh, says, look, you know, God is the God of the, of the living, not of the dead. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God wouldn't identify himself that way unless those figures were still living. Why would God identify himself by dead people? Um, powerful argument, actually. It really worked uh, with, with the Sadducees, but it's quoting from the books of Moses. So the, the, the issue here, Matt, is that the different uh, divisions of Jews had different views on canon. Sadducees and Samaritans said it was only the Pentateuch. The Pharisees said, well, there's 22 books, and it was roughly like the Jewish Bible is uh, today. The Essenes were including the Book of Jubilees and the Books of Enoch as canonical in their Bible, so to speak. So there was a lot of religious confusion going on, and they were waiting the Messiah to come and solve this. And, Mm -hmm. And Jesus does this. Jesus teaches the apostles by word and example which books to quote as authoritative that was passed down by example until the late 300s where it starts to get written down by the Mm -hmm. councils of bishops. Okay. Uh, Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. That's really good. Uh, Kyle Whittington asks, does the Bible condone slavery? Uh, Actually not. You know, I wrote my dissertation on the Jubilee laws, um, which are the laws of freedom. And so what you find out is that um, under Moses, um, under Moses, true slavery is outlawed for Israelites. That's the point of Leviticus 25. You can indenture a fellow Israelite if he owes you money. That means you can, you can make him work for you, okay, but you can't treat him like a slave. You, he, his civil rights are always intact. You know what, what that would look like. I don't know exactly in the ancient world, but he has civil rights as a free man, but yes, he, he can, you can, he can work for you to pay off his debt to a point only to the Jubilee year. And then every 50th year, all this is canceled and everybody's freed and goes home. So the worst thing that can happen to an Israelite is that you have to work for somebody to pay off your debt to them. You know, it's like a, like kind of like indentured servitude. Now the other people surrounding the people of Israel could be enslaved, but only temporarily. And this is what you find, for example, in Deuteronomy 15, and there's a parallel passage earlier in Exodus 21. It talks about Hebrew slaves. Now the, the things that people mistake about that is they, they, they think that Hebrew is synonymous with Israelite. It's not. 
Abraham was a Hebrew. So all of Abraham's descendants are Hebrews as well. That includes the Ishmaelites, the Edomites, and a whole bunch of nations that we would regard as as Semitic peoples, including most of the Arabs. Um, peoples that later settled in a ring around the nation of Israel, which is the logical place where they might get, uh, you know, what might purchase slaves. So in Deuteronomy 15, it allows the Israelites to buy slaves from the Hebrews, which would be the people surrounding them. But even there, it limits the term of slavery only for uh, six years. And in the seventh year, you have to release even your foreigner has to be released. So it cannot be permanent unless they want it, unless they feel like their position in your household is better than what they're liable to get anywhere else. And then if they submit to it, then then their their earlobe can be pierced and then they could become a permanent member of the household. And people say, like, why would you ever want to be a slave for your whole life? Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, employment security and benefits. Like the ancient world was brutal. Working for yourself was no fun. It was a good way to die. Mm. It was, as Jordan Pugh said, not good. <laughs> it's okay. not good. It's not good. <laughs> okay. A lot, you know, d- day laboring was was not a very fun thing in the ancient world. If a day laborer was sick, he didn't eat that way that day because he didn't earn any money that that day. Oftentimes, it was just hand to mouth. And um, it, but but a slave, a slave was a member of the household. If he got sick, he was cared for. The master, if for no other reason than the fact that he had a huge investment in this uh, in this worker, you know, would 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 care for you and nurse you back to health and so on because, yeah, he had invested a lot of money in you and 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 needed your labor and so on. So, mm. slavery typically had benefits to it, and and you frequently find in the ancient world um, that that bonds of affection uh, arose between um, between uh, you know. Uh, masters and and their servants uh, in these uh, situations and and people would sell themselves into slavery um, in order to gain you know the security that it offered over being a, mm-hmm. a day laborer. I, that's hard for us to get our minds around, you know. Was in, it, in the modern was age, it chattel slavery, like is practiced in the New World, but it, no, I mean, pe- I think people get that what's, confused what's, a lot. What's so yeah, what's so perverse about Slavery in the New World was it ended up as a as a race based thing, and and people have a hard time wrapping their ri- mind around the fact that in the ancient world is like anybody could become a slave, you know, whether you're Caucasian or African or Semitic or whatever. That was like equal opportunity employer, you know. So anybody, and, and you know, within Egypt, Egyptians themselves could be reduced to slavery if they committed a crime or something like that, you know. And so it was. It was it was not racial at all uh, mm-hmm. in in the ancient world, um, so that's one thing you have to wrap your mind. And and the other thing you got to wrap wrap your mind around is is that typically uh, that you know there there were expectations, you know there were cultural expectations, and uh, yeah, legally, um, an owner might be able to be a real jerk, um, but there were social norms that were typically upheld, and most people did not want to be perceived as uh, an evil person in the eyes of the rest of society. And so usually there was this effort to be humanitarian towards the people that worked for you. Yeah. This Jubilee year. Yeah. So that... Does, so, yeah, does, I mean, to, mean to, I was... to recap on the biblical thing, so... Moses prohibits slavery for Israelites and even limits it for foreigners that the Israelites might buy. No more than seven years unless they unless they mm-hmm. really like being part of your household. So that's the old Old Testament, you know? And if that's the Old Testament, the freedom that we have in Christ, shouldn't that, you mm-hmm. know, bespeak more? So you have the passages in Ephesians, for example, where Paul says, uh, masters, um, you know, uh, do not be harsh with your slaves, and slaves obey your masters. And that's a pragmatic thing because there were huge numbers of folks that were um, were uh, uh, dependent on their sustenance by their master. And in Paul can't just make some kind of blanket fiat declaration that everybody free your slaves because that could actually be non-humanitarian for 
a, no, a, a large number of people, there, that would put a lot of people out onto the out into the open marketplace where they may or may not have had skills to really make it as day laborers. And the elderly, you know, elderly servants in the Greco-Roman world, it was regarded as, um, as a noble thing to keep the elderly on your, you know, roles as servants and allow them to do light labor into what we would regard their retirement years, you know, and at that point, you know, the, the household was not getting as much, uh, you know, economic value out of these elderly servants as they were actually producing. If you know what I mean, there's like more, more care was involved in keeping them alive Mm -hmm. than they were doing by like, you know, snapping peas in the kitchen. But that was regarded as a noble thing because there were these bonds, like they were Mm -hmm. part of the household and so on. So Paul doesn't do anything so rash as just say, well, everybody free your slaves, because that could lead to a lot of sick people, elderly people, weak people, et cetera, you know, out on the open marketplace and starving to death. But he does apply uh, the law of love, you know, and and the law of do unto others what you would have them do to you, the golden rule. Um, that applies in all situations. And that can redeem even situations that are like legally or economically non-advantageous. So if you're in a situation where this guy owns a bunch of slaves and it's really awkward if he tries to manumit them and what are they all going to do if they if they're suddenly not you know, part of his household, that's their source of sustenance, but he can treat them well and they can treat him well and we can, we can work past this, you know, and then when there's an opportunity to change the way that society works, we can, we can take that opportunity to, you know, make institutions that are less, you know, susceptible to being abused. But in the meantime, you know, we got to do something. And what is that? Why that's, that's to love each other and to treat each other well within imperfect, mm. imperfect economic institutions. Excellent. Yeah. yeah excellent. Thanks. Um, how historically reliable is Tobit? Asks one local supporter. I've heard Protestants say it contains errors, legendary characters like Ahikar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mixing up kings, bad timeline, etc. Right. Um, so I would say the you know I think the core of the core of Tobit is uh, a historical narrative, um, but we do have um, kind of a, you know a bit of literary license uh, going on um, to you know enhance the narrative a little bit and uh, make it poignant and um, you know uh, catchy and um, you know good for retelling. Um, but I think that ultimately Tobit and Sarah and Tobias and, you know, these are uh, real people. What about Job? Yeah, Job. Job, I believe, is a historical figure. He's treated as historical uh, in the New Testament. Um, uh, but the book of Job is written as a drama. So I like to compare it to, um, say, the uh, dramas that Shakespeare uh, did on historical figures. Um, so there's, you know, there's... The structure of Job is very stylized. It's a set of dialogues with his three friends. You, you have three cycles where each of the three friends speak in order and Job responds in order. And that's very much like a kind of a, you know, a play. And you can perform it. And it has been performed mm. um, with actors, you know, and the, giving these long soliloquies essentially back and forth between each other. Um, but that doesn't mean that Job is not a historical figure. I mean, you can write a drama about a historical figure and you can write a, a, a drama that is inspired by God uh, theologically and that leads us into pr- a profound exploration of the human condition of sin and of evil. And uh, that's what I think we have in Job. Having Christ or an apostle reference an Old Testament figure isn't proof that they believed him or her to be such. Could, I mean, what do you if, mean by that? Well, it, you're saying that he's treated as a historical figure in the New Testament. Where, where are you getting right. that from in the New Testament? Right. Well, in the book of Hebrews, he's one of the saints that's uh, you know mentioned and held up in his ex- ex- as an example of his I'm patience. I'm just thinking, and, if, if these yeah. are fi- fictitious stories, it shouldn't be terribly surprising if people in the New Testament refer to them. And that doesn't them referring to them yeah. doesn't make when you, them. Yeah, when you're dealing with when you're dealing with uh, our Lord, though, you got to exercise care um, because if we just dismiss the knowledge of the God Man as you know mm. bounded by the culture of his time, then there's no end of what you can do. That I see. So why should we trust Jesus? He was just a Jew of his age. So 
Yeah, there's some wiggle room there with, you know, some of the authors of the New Testament, perhaps. Um, but especially when we're looking at the testimony of Jesus uh, towards the Old Testament, I think this is particularly applicable with figures like Moses. You know, again and again, Jesus refers to Moses as a as a historical prophet who wrote um, and uh, and um, and spoke mm -hmm. and taught, and um, uh, yeah, and and that's uh, I think ultimately that's not compatible with uh, views of Moses that. Uh, hold him to be uh, merely a literary figure, uh, later fiction at the time of Ezra or something. All right, couple couple of fun questions as we wrap up here. So you teach at Franciscan University of yes. Why is that a great school? Franciscan is a great school because we've been blessed with a beautiful fusion of uh, charismatic spirituality uh, with um, theological orthodoxy. And uh, so the teaching is sound. It's in keeping with the teaching of the saints and, and the teaching of the magisterium. Um, but there's also kind of a beautiful freedom about the way that the, that the faith is expressed. Um, and, and there's a variety of, you know, kind of different devotional and worship. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> there's a variety of different devotional and worship practices and you styles, as it were. I'm out of water. This has not been touched by my lips. I promise you. We just it, it just fell up the it filled up the stone. All right, good. Yeah, no, yeah. Divine liturgy is sometimes celebrated. Latin mass was sometimes celebrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's there, there's kind of a, a freedom and an openness uh, w with with a unquestioned uh, loyalty to the church's teaching. So if here's the question: If Franciscan gave you one year a one year sabbatical and you could study anything you wanted to, maybe write another dissertation, what would it be on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would finish my critique of uh, modern uh, Pentateuchal studies, probably. Um, cause I think there, there really was a Moses and I think it's an important thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, his books get treated as these late fictions and there's very strong reasons why that's not the case and not a good interpretation. So I'd probably, that'd be one thing. All right. Final question. Also uh, catch up on my sleep. Yeah. <laughs> what is the least impressive thing you do for leisure? Watch Hallmark movies. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Why? I'm a married man. <laughs> <laughs> so your wife watches them and you're forced yes. to, or do you force her to watch them? No, no judgment uh, here. This is I wouldn't say forced, but I mean, <laughs> what's a married couple to do? Uh, you know, you want to watch something that's not morally offensive, that, yeah. that doesn't leave you gagging, you know? And, that's a good point. And everything's so woke and, and so crude and, you know? But uh, has Hallmark not ventured in that direction? They they have some woke stuff which we don't watch, uh, but most of it isn't. Um, it's just just still traditional man meets girl. They don't show any bedroom scenes, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of innocent, lighthearted. Uh, that, it's that's all terribly unrealistic, and it's all shot in British Columbia. But uh, and after a while, you get to recognize that, <laughs> which kind of spoils the mood. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it's it's like uh, it's like innocent, lighthearted entertainment, and uh, yeah, you know, our our lives are are pretty serious. I do kind of pretty serious thing for a living, and yeah. some of our kids have some pretty serious health issues, and so we're looking for a little bit of escapism. I like that. Yeah, yeah the kind of gagging that modern television has you do. <laughs> you know, you could just swap that, and the gagging can be over the acting, and that can at least be better. <laughs> I just watched, um, unfortunately. And it won't interest you if you haven't heard of it. It might interest you. Uh, the Last of Us. So much gay crap pushed. It was disgusting. Also, having women who are in charge of small armies, whiny, chubby women. Yo. They would be slapped. And they're taking I, orders from these big, we, beefy, I, bearded men. Just a small tap to the head with a gun would have taken them out. When you watch it and you know they're very clearly pushing the fact that women can do what men can do, even though everybody knows that's obviously not the case. Bro, you triggered me. You don't have I, to be here for what we're about to say. Yeah. <laughs> when Jeff Cavins was in your no, seat, I don't even reading know if you want to be. <laughs> whenever he was uncomfortable. I just, I've been noticing more and more that, like, women in leadership positions when they do something that seems to be even like a small mistake it 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 results in like doubling down like i'm seeing it in like politics now 
Hmm. where like there are like female governors. Like you remember uh, the governor of North Dakota or South Dakota? And she like made a comment about how she's okay with transgenderism or something. And like the entire Republican party exploded. And instead of just being like, yep, my bad. She like doubled down on it and it got worse. And it's like, but everyone's like that today. That's not a woman thing. I think it's worse with women. Um, yeah. Just when you, when you're getting sold a bill of goods, it's, and the, and what was funny is, and I wouldn't recommend people watch the show. Don't watch it. It was not worth it. But my Go wife, when games. she starts something, she has to finish it. Go play the games. But on the second to last episode or the third to last episode, it opened up with this guy who was a white, heterosexual, Christian male. And I said to my wife, I promise you he's going to be evil. And immediately, within Chris. minutes, he's completely evil. It was just because we're all evil. We are. Admit it, man. Yeah, yeah. Let's just, go. I haven't fully accepted. No, no, not let's go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that took a turn. Thank yes. you for being here. Absolutely. I always yeah. love talking to you. You are a wealth of knowledge. You have such a great way of putting things and helping knuckleheads like me get a better understanding of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. How, what, I appreciate that. Is it, so we 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 started this show talking about um, Emmaus Academy, com slash Matt. Two week trial. Click it. Check it out. Is there one course on there that you've done that you're most proud of that you think, gosh, go I'm check this out? I'm proud of all out. of them. Yeah, check out my, I, I've got a course on the Gospels and then my Psalms course just got released. Mm. So if folks want to get into the Psalms, that's a beautiful thing. Maybe people pray the office. Uh, if you don't pray the office, maybe you just like to get the Psalms into your life. They are the heartbeat of the church's prayer. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I did a little course in the Psalms, uh, help people get acquainted with the book of Psalms, and then gave some suggestions about how you can work it into your prayer life on a daily basis. Um, so I hope that people will check that out. Really, you know, that's really important. My mom um, started me on this practice of reading five Psalms a day. Uh, what it's a mom. Yeah, it's kind of like a, it was, I realized in hindsight, it was kind of like a poor man's divine office kind of thing. You know, so it's like every three hours you read a psalm and, and you, you go every 30th psalm. So right. on the first day of the month, it's like Psalm 1, Psalm 31, Psalm 61, etc. Oh. And that, that gives you five psalms a day and you do it every three hours. And uh, it's amazing how like if you actually do that, like your life events at that moment in your day so often like tie in with the word of God. Mm. Um, so it's a beautiful practice. And but, I, want, I want to let people know how they can game the system here. So click the link, stpaulcenter.com slash Matt. You'll get a two-week trial if you sign up there. Take Dr. Bergman's course within two weeks and then quit if you want to. And then you won't have to pay them anything. She'll never want to quit if you take a course with me. <laughs> no, they but might they not like no. that in your ad. <laughs> no, what's that? They might not like you telling well, people how to not give them money in the ad. No, but here's, I know. And it's here's why I say it. I, I think there are so many things out there clamoring for our attention oh, so that we just like i oh, just piss off i'm sure it's good whatever but what i'm saying is what's great about a two-week trial is you can actually decide for yourself if it's good and i i actually was really impressed like when y'all sent it over i'm like i'm sure it's fine but i was like holy mackerel this is amazing yeah yeah Take so i don't think Paul people will Dr. quit Hunt. or want to quit but yeah 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 have this yes have yes. dr Hahn in your living room and yeah, then it's like taking take a course on bed Paul with him. you and Stop. have him read to you on Hallow. Stop. Have you heard you're, Doctor you're, How I did this to you? Have your I done life could be haunted. <laughs> have I? <laughs> have the I played you? of your life. Dr. Han reading to you? It might freak no, you out. I, I, We're going to do it right now before did we wrap he, up. Does he read scripture? He reads the, the yeah. reading for the day? Yeah, so there's Bible stories, and I, I keep saying that it's always awkward listening to Dr. Han to get back to sleep, and then I see him in the morning and I blush. I don't really. <laughs> Let's see. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Bible story. <laughs> My name is Dr. Scott Hahn. Come on. Huh? You, you can't last five minutes with that guy reading, do you? <laughs> He'll put you right to bed. There you go. Well, thank All you right. Thanks for Scott. coming on. God Sounds bless. Good. Thanks, yep. Thursday. <laughs>